three, two, one. Even though I'm no better than a beast, don't I have the right to listen to Sardonicast? Hello, everybody. I'm Adam from Your Movie Sex. How's it going? Mm, nice. Yeah, I'm Alex from IHG. And, uh, do you usually talk that way? I mean, huh? I was. I would hope that, you know, no matter how immoral and unethical I am, that I would still have the right to listen to Sardonicast. I feel like that Ooh. is one of uh, life's basic necessities that should probably be covered under some sort of governmental program to help those less fortunate. If we could get a government deal on the premium subscribers, everybody mm. gets one premium subscriber and then we just get the money for that, you know? We're really solving the human condition over here, huh? I think so. I think I think it would be beneficial for the world i think a lot of problems that we see you know socioeconomically morally i think they would just disappear overnight so we should we should get on that yeah i think you're right have you ever thought about just how insane some of these government contractor relationships are like they they literally can just charge whatever yes. they want and because they have a contract with the government there's like i i've i've heard about it from friends that that work in certain industries like the transit system in Vancouver. They're like, okay, so in order to fix these these transit ticketing machines, you need a specific type of battery that you could find on Amazon for like a dollar, yeah. but they're contracted through this specific company where they are charging $100 and they're just marking it up because they have a contract with the government. Like, I don't oh, think yeah. people realize how many instances of that like exist all throughout every layer of government in pretty much every country where you have a yeah. government contractor just charging way more than they should. Oh my God, there was a huge uh, scandal over the... Uh, there was there was an app that was made for, for COVID tracking in Canada. And... <laughs> oh, you had a scandal over that as well. There was a yeah. huge one here too. Yeah, like a big one. Billion, I think it was a couple billion that yeah. was spent on our, our one, even though Germany was offering their code for free we yeah just, like, turned it away like pe people <laughs> figure out the numbers and they're like wait how did it how did it take a billion fucking dollars <laughs> to to make this app that doesn't work well like where did that money yeah. go it's a big fucking scam but now and no it one sucks cares. yeah and then and then you know all of these issues that exist within government then people go like oh government doesn't work Therefore, we need to privatize everything. It's like, oh, shit, like that. You're going to run into the exact same <laughs> problem. Like, we, uh, it's so frustrating. Uh, yeah. We need better accountability. No, I swear they just they just add a couple zeros to the end. There was, there was a recent one near me where there was like a, some kind of pretty basic roadworks where they put like a little notch in the road and put a sign up and it costs like millions of taxpayer money. So, <laughs> well, why? What are you, <laughs> no good what are you reason. Doing? Where are you putting it? Yeah, yeah. Because the society is so lulled that we don't know how to hold people accountable and our representatives accountable. Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, we're asleep at the fucking wheel and uh, we're all just kind of complacent. You know, we got TikTok. We got McDonald. We got TikTok. Most people are like, what, one paycheck, monthly paycheck away from destitution or? Yeah. That's, that's a bit more of a focus. Yeah, you'd think that would be a fucking wake up call. I was talking <laughs> yeah. with my roommates literally yesterday about how much money you could make doing crimes <laughs> it's like people wouldn't yeah. be criminals if it wasn't entirely lucrative and then you have so many people that are just like you know they're not criminals they're doing exactly what they're told to do but they're making a shit income everything's getting so much more expensive there's a rent crisis and oh my god if only they had a sardonic ass premium subscription it would be fine exactly but, <sighs> speaking of uh moral ethical uh very super okay and not weird uh pieces of media the idol <laughs> we uh <laughs> we watched this one i didn't watch your video yet i was waiting to have this conversation and and I'll, i figured i'd watch yeah. it after but i i love that that kind of uh inspired you to to create a video on your i hate everything channel big comeback for yeah. the idol yeah i haven't done one on a tv show for a while but man like I was, I was, I don't know about you, but I, I was baffled when I was watching this. Yeah. My expectations were already <laughs> low from kind of the buzz and like yeah. hearing about it being like half of it being scrapped and reshot and all this. But I'm kind of, I kind of like Euphoria and I was curious, like Sam Levinson had taken over and like what, 
what was this going to come together like? And man, holy shit. <laughs> yeah. Quite like an embarrassing, like, I, I, I am so curious what, like, your overall takeaway of what this show was trying to say in the end was, because like, my, it throws a lot of stuff out there that seemed to kind of conflict with each other. And my ultimate, like, interpretation from it was like, it, it, it doesn't really know, or it, 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 it can't. <laughs> Maybe attempt something, but it definitely does not come together in a way, an intended way. No. Especially with how, like, the songs have taken off on TikTok and it's like this weird, I don't know, it's, it's like criticizing the music industry, but at the same time, it's weirdly romanticizing it. Like, there's a whole romanticization angle, the weird exploitation angle. There's a, a lot of stuff it's thrown out there and definitely not na nailing. And I mean, first and foremost, it's just, it's so boring and repetitive. Like, do you agree on that? Like, <laughs> holy shit, like, it, it, nothing happens. Yeah, there was one episode where I was just losing my mind. Like, just fucking do something. <laughs> I think it was the episode, it might have been like three, I don't remember. Yeah, episode three, my notes are, holy fucking Christ, this episode feels like five hours long, despite it being the <laughs> shortest at 45 minutes, in all caps. Yeah. <laughs> that was my... <laughs> oh, that might, was that the one where there was, most of the episode is them kind of just sat around a dinner table yes. talking? <laughs> like yeah, outside. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It's insane. And what's so funny is, um, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard that this was originally supposed to be six episodes, and then they, they cut it down as it was being released because of poor reception. Yeah. Well, Which is very th funny. there's conflicting stuff on that. There was definitely, I think, six episodes planned with that Amy Simetz version. Fascinating. But yeah, I'm not sure if they had, if they cut stuff out on the fly that much or if that was more just when Sam Levins took over, maybe they scrapped an episode or edited a bunch of stuff out or something. So what was the story behind that? Basically, she had a version and then The weekend didn't like it and then they just completely scrapped it and did something else. Is that basically, yeah. Th yeah. There aren't like any like concrete sources um, that I could find properly explaining it. But yeah, from what I could gather, there was some kind of creative cra clash with uh, the weekend and Amy Simon. Creator so clash. She departed. Oh yeah, maybe maybe they can uh, settle it in the ring for yeah. Creator Crash Clash Three. But uh... <laughs> Amy Simon versus the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I found out. Um, <laughs> like the cinematographer was the same from Euphoria, but you would never guess no, um, that it's not like a all. similar crew with how it came together. And I assume that's just from the nature of taking over a project that was 70% done and then having to scramble something together that makes everyone happy. You yeah. Know? Like it was it was like sh shot at the weekend's like own house. <laughs> he clearly had uh, like a lot of involvement in this. Like he's crazy. It's his it's passion like project. Writer. It's his baby. It's his passion project, yeah. <laughs> his baby's yeah. a big turd. And like, <laughs> it's crazy. Like, it was, man. His, it was his butt baby. I don't know what he was thinking thinking he could helm it this way you know narcissism like, I, was, I, I say it like towards the end of my video like Matt, even if he really wanted to tell this story why did he have to star in it like surely if he if he cared about it this much and all the insight he has could he not hand the baton over to like an actor who could tell the story for him or did it have to be his face it had to be him he's a star boy yeah he can do anything he is a star boy he's a he's a he's a star boy <laughs> Well, I'd b before like making my video or whatever, I'd, I'd underestimated the popularity of The Weeknd. I'm not like a big fan of his or anything. I've heard a couple of his songs. I've never sat down and listened to a Weeknd album. But then I go and look on Spotify yeah. and well, he's probably like the biggest pop star in the world based off like the numbers on there. Like he's in the top 10. Yeah, he's like a Drake baby or something. Yeah. He's, he's like, I think he's Canadian. <laughs> he is. That's right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and Drake, yeah. Yeah, there's an interesting, uh, very corporate, artificial, kind of really lame music scene coming out of Canada and infecting the rest of the world. Uh, yeah, what's the deal? Thanks, Ontario. <laughs> I don't know. It's just it. It's what it's one of those things. I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> we have a lot of arts grants, and we have like we we have a law that a certain percentage of artists and content that you hear on the radio or television has to be Canadian content, which oh, is weird and like okay. overly protectionist, yeah. but it, it creates this weird scenario where there will be some artists that are just huge in Canada and not anywhere else. And then alternatively, it'll also create scenarios where, you know, like Nickelback and Justin Bieber will just fucking skyrocket and then... <laughs> get uh 
played a lot of other places. It sucks because the entire population of Canada is less than that of California. And there's only so many (laughs) artists in Canada. And then within that, there's only so many talented artists in Canada. Obviously, there's not none. We were just talking with a really talented Canadian artist last episode on the podcast. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like they don't exist, but it's uh, very unfortunate what people decide to promote and share. I guess you could say that about any country or any genre, any medium, but uh, mm-hmm. Canada's got this weird particular one, I, I feel. The, the, the Canadian rapper or singer hip-hop-ish yeah, scene exports. is is a very... Uh, Drake gets med- made fun of all the fucking time. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> like deserved. Some of these stuff. In, in hip-hop crowds, he's the butt of the joke, like, everywhere (laughs) so the weekend is just kind of an extension of that very peculiar character (laughs) Mm -hmm. so this is a spoiler discussion everybody just in case i started watching episode one and i was doing it as a watch along on my channel so if anybody hasn't Mm -hmm. seen it and they want to watch it with my commentary which might make it more digestible go to the yms watch alongs channel you'll find uh me watching and commenting on all five episodes. And this is one of those things where I knew I was saving it for one of those because of how shit it looked in the clips people were posting on yeah. X. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it was immediately infamous, huh? Yeah. Immediately. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Even before it came out. Yeah. Yeah. It seemed it seemed like something that would be fun to riff on. And it was. But it was like one of those car crash scenarios where I couldn't look away and mm-hmm. I binged the whole thing in one night, even though that was not my intention. When I started episode one, I was like, okay, I'll just watch an episode. You'd see how it goes. I finished the whole thing mm-hmm. in one night. I stayed up. I was like, we, <laughs> we got to see this through. Like what's, what the fuck is this? And, uh, yeah, it's, it's very hilariously pointless while trying to have a point. Mm -hmm. Very conflicting and confused. Seems like it's trying to be several things at once. And even if it is a singular vision, like I don't know how many people's visions it was, there just seems to be no cohesive presentation or through line or, you know, the the pieces of the puzzle don't fit. (laughs) <laughs> it's it's like you've got several different puzzles no. and then it is it like it's structured around this like this twist comes up towards the end right like in that last episode where they like pull the rug from under and sh- to try and like change oh, yeah. the dynamics and make you think about like oh <laughs> i think i called that also the weekend the weekend wasn't in control this whole time and it was actually L- lily rose depp pulling the being the puppet master the whole time and it was like what the f- what the hell like and then it just like undoes all of this like because everything previous is this kind of toxic relationship they have and they're building the weekend character up as this like infamous pimp who's got like a name for himself and is kind of a troubled character and maybe someone she shouldn't be <laughs> fraternizing with. But then it kind of t- turns around at the last second to be like, no, this is actually kind of like a love story. And it was all about that side of it and the, <sighs> the love triangle and the beefing <laughs> with each other. But, and the love wins in the end. Yeah. Why? Like I, when they were getting together, I was like, what the fuck are you trying to do? Like getting back together at the mm-hmm. end, let alone the fact that there is absolutely zero chemistry between these two characters. Actors. Oh, my God. Like there's, <laughs> they don't have any chemistry at all. None. Absolutely no. Yeah, it's the most awkward attempt at a relationship displayed on screen, maybe ever. (laughs) Which which kills the whole concept immediately for this entire thing to even work remotely. The the lead two would have to be better actors and to have some chemistry. Because yeah, there's a lot of bad dialogue here, but I feel like it could be sold better by better actors. But man, (laughs) this is like the perfect concoction of shit. Like the way it comes together. Yeah, that dialogue, man. Like it, it's. That's what keeps that. That's what keeps it entertaining. It's just the level of dialogue and how like porny it is, and just so unsubtle, you know. And like the the most obvious ways possible. That's what you get when you give the weekend carte blanche to do whatever he wants, <laughs> <laughs> which is how they said it in oh the show. God, it's and like- it's one of those things where it's like the rest of it's so bad that you have to think: was that a jo- was that an intentional joke? Because the pacing of the editing didn't make yeah. it feel like that. And the rest of the show and the context within the show, it's kind of impossible to tell. Like, is that just how The weekend thought it was supposed to be pronounced and nobody corrected him? And, you know, like, I don't know. 
Carte Blanche. Yeah. <laughs> it and said it, so. And they can't figure out if it's like, <laughs> yeah, because I was reading that as a joke, but then it just makes it more confusing because it's like they kind of end up endorsing that character in ways, but they also condemn him. It's a, the, man that that character. I think she's called Destiny. Mm-hmm. She like has that whole a bunch of sit downs where she's like getting real with characters and, and yeah. finding out the truth about the weekend and his backstory and just how serious it got and how violent it got and his his tumultuous history. And that and it and it seems like it's building to towards that more of a conclusion where it's like they need to separate in some form in order for Lily Rose Depp to get over the death of her mum and gain some autonomy back into her life. But yeah, it just doesn't really go that direction at all. It just winds up going the inverse direction of what you'd expect and what would even really make sense unless they're trying to do this whole, yeah, isn't this like a a sad tragedy of how this toxic relationship, she's got trapped in the situation but it's not really framed like that in that conclusive episode. It's more of like a F the producers. This is like real love. And, and we're so talented. Kind of go go boss my it. way to this. Yeah. Yeah. It's a success story about the industry that we're trying to criticize at the same time. Also. <laughs> yeah. I think it was trying to do a bit of like a whiplashy type thing with that. Yeah. That ending that's like, yeah, kind of comes out of the blue and I don't know. It's like a, a moment where things change and, new new rules are established and new character dynamics come out but it just i don't know i think it fails as a commentary on the industry ultimately it fails on as being a love story it fails on the basics of being a drama even like it, it <laughs> or or, uh, or the the musical angle as well uh, it fails at being coherent <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah straight up or relatable it's one of the most unrelatable pieces of media i've ever seen in my entire life yeah yeah, true. Like, who's su- who's supposed to get anything out of this, and what are they supposed to get out of it? Who, who, and what? <laughs> what, what, if, what? Why did you make this? <laughs> yeah, like, who do you think the target demographic is then? Because uh, weekend it, fans it must be just the weekend fans yeah. and Lily Rose Depp fans. Because I found out like she has a huge uh, social media presence. She's like famous on TikTok because I guess she's like a model and is obviously Johnny Depp's daughter. So. I don't know what they were planning with this. And if you go on Spotify and put her name in, yeah, you can see like the songs from the show, um, oh. which I, they like officially released and they have a, a ton of listens and a viral on TikTok and people be like, oh, the show really sucks, but man, these, these songs kind of fire type yeah. of thing. You know? so it's like, <laughs> what? Like what? So <laughs> you've just done the inverse of like all the criticism of this horrible industry and then you're using it as like a, a platform to launch the Nepo yeah. The Nepo album. <laughs> <laughs> the star of Yoga Hosers. Yeah, that's the only other thing I've seen her in. Because there was I, a bit I of didn't like. Watch that. I when, <laughs> when the idol dropped, um, like originally, there was a bit of like debate or whatever on X, or it might have still been Twitter then, um, uh, debating Lily Rose Depp's acting abilities. Because so the, there was the crowd saying that, oh, she's just never been paired up against someone who can act. So that's why you've never seen her true potential. Um, they were showing clips of that movie where she, uh, it's like a Renaissance movie where she acts against, uh, Timothy Chalamet. Tim Cham. Um, it was like Tim Cham. Yeah. Um, and it was just like, a, uh, like I watched the clip that people were putting out there trying to prove her acting ability. And it's just kind of like, this kind of is the same thing, man. She's got that model thing going on where it's like a very, <laughs> A very model-y performance. That's all they see is the model. And yeah, even even that aside, like just the material, there's not enough there. There's not enough going on. That chemistry is not there. The it's just it is embarrassing. It's a, it's yes. an embarrassing project all round. And it's uh, and the reaction too from like, have you seen any of the weekends like uh, social media no, response to it, please. like on Instagram and Twitter? <laughs> please like, tell me. <laughs> he's uh. He said all sorts about it, kind of like uh, coping about it, I'd say, like posting these cringy comparisons of like Scarface and like the the, the framing being similar of his character in certain scenes oh. and whatnot, and <laughs> kind of doing the whole like, yeah, replying to every single person about the idol and clearly being sensitive about it. And it's like... It is his butt baby. On, at least so. stand by it. <laughs> yeah. But at least like uh, something that made me like Tom Holland a bit more recently was like he was in this interview about I think it was an Apple TV show he's on and he was like very candid just like yeah 
I don't think people are, like think it's very good or whatever, but <laughs> I was in it and I, I accept that. Is that the one where he's a gay boy? It is the one where he's a gay boy. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I haven't seen that yet. Yeah, me neither. I, I probably won't. But, uh... Yeah. What do you think of the music then? Because that's like a big part. There's so many scenes where they're trying to capture that whole, you know, the that creative spark, lightning in a bottle. We're, we're in the studio. We got the producers there. People are riffing on the piano. And then they have these scenes that are framed as like, oh, it's the moment they've they found that riff, they found that hook, they found that song that's going to get her back into the zeitgeist. <laughs> it seems so weirdly artificial. Mm. Like the, the music yeah. itself, like maybe completely detached from the show is like fine, I guess. Nothing mm. to write home about. You know, it's, it's poppy. It seems like it would appeal to some sort of mass audiences of young ish people maybe but the way it's handled in the show it just it, it 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 never felt like any of the scenes where they were creating music was any sort of genuine representation of how music is created mm -hmm. and i i mean maybe they were trying to subvert that at the same time he like what did he do he like fingered her pussy while she was singing i don't yeah, remember he did like do it. she had that he's like no you gotta sing good now you got to be having sex at the same time. Uh -huh. Like, okay. Like, is that <laughs> supposed to be powerful or meaningful or scary? What am I supposed to feel from that? It just feels like weirdly mm -hmm. explicit for the sake of being explicit. And maybe the weekend was yeah. just really horny when he wrote this. And he yeah, just wanted to do It felt like self-insert material to me, you know, where yeah, it's but... like, oh, I've got to make sure I'm banging Lily Rose Depp and the majority of the scenes I'm in. Because of course I am. Because I'm the weekend. That's just what would happen. Of course, I'm the weekend. I'm the guy. <laughs> so it all okay. So let's let's. I I'm. <laughs> I kind of want to do a plot recap. I don't know how like this might take one minute. I don't know. <laughs> I have a mm. couple notes in each episode that can kind of give me a clue. So I watched this probably I don't know two months ago or something. Yeah. Um. Yeah. My notes are from July 9th, so a month and a half ago when we were recording this. So she's doing the modeling and then there's a drama because they're like, there's a picture with cum on your face. It's on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. don't know who took it. And then it's like, oh, we now her career is going to be known for having cum on her face. And then they spend the rest of the episode. She's like dancing. They're like, oh, it's su I, such a beautiful homage to Britney that she's doing right now. And they're talking about this insisted importance that they're trying to mm -hmm. that they're trying to project onto the audience to make you feel as though what you're watching is so much more special than it is but they're really just talking about it yeah and it's not special <laughs> you know <laughs> like could you you know, the opening dance scene in climax you don't need to be told by other characters watching the, the dance mm -hmm. scene that there's something special there you can just get absorbed into it you can just yeah. watch it and appreciate the fucking choreography and the tone and what it's going for and what it's doing and the cinematography yeah. that was all in one shot and it kept going for so long after. You know, brilliant yeah, movie Yeah, that there. bugged me so much. They do that a lot um, with like the producer characters, especially when they're observing like a new song or whatever. They yeah. have some dialogue like, are you seeing this? Yeah. This is amazing. <laughs> like all this kind of stuff. Exactly. It's like, just... And it's so insistent <laughs> and it's it's like they they have to tell you how to feel Mm -hmm. Because what you're seeing is not all that special. And then even when they tell you how to feel, it's like, am I supposed to be feeling this? Is that what mm -hmm. you're going for? Is that what you're doing? Yeah. So a lot of really boring shit in the first episode. A lot of repetitive they, nonsense. They kind of vaguely set up. Um, you, we're introduced to her at a time where she's like just... She's in like a really bad headspace. She's like had to pull off one of her latest tours or cancel it in some form. So she's in this low point after her mum died, who was her like mentor. So that's how they explain how uh, the weekend was able to get in there to begin with, because he owns this CD club that he insists she goes to, and he manages to, well, what we think, kind of get in control of her or at least in contact with her and yeah. get her to immediately fall for him. So yeah, she, so she goes to a club, and then the weekend who owns the club is like, "Hey, are you the cum face girl?" And then <laughs> that's how yeah. their relationship starts. <laughs> and she Romantic, completely just yeah. ditches her friend 
she she goes to the club with one other person played by Rachel Sennett, who I love, but she seemed absolutely confused as to what she was in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, she's normally great. <laughs> she she was like the comedic relief character, but it seemed like it was because she thought she was in a comedy and nobody else thought that, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> which yeah. must have been a pretty funny direction. Yeah, just a complete waste of that. Uh, there are a few wasted uh, actors in this, but she's probably the biggest one. Yeah. Especially if you're doing like a satire commentary, she's really great at that. Yes. You know, like uh, they totally squandered it. Yeah, Bottoms is out this week. I'm thinking about mm. catching it. I don't know. She co wrote that. Yeah, I'm hearing good things. Yeah, so she, Lily Rose Depp just ditches her friend for no reason just to make out with this weird club owner who's like a, the greasiest, most disgusting looking guy. <laughs> yeah, that's the word, greasiest. He's with greasy! The rat tail, they, they like purposefully wrote that whole rat tail thing in, I think with this reshoot version, because there is like there are old set pictures of uh, that original version that you can find out there, and he looks just way more normal, like The Weeknd. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like they, they went in on this costume design for some reason, and I think one of the episodes even, ref- like the episode titles references the whole rat tail standing it's like what why are they like trendy in la or something right now i don't <laughs> i don't know it's just he's so know. off-putting I, I, yeah. I just never buy for a second that she'd even look in this guy's direction but yeah episode two they're in the weekend's house uh she is showing off her song it kind of sucks uh <laughs> he puts an ice cube drink yeah. on her pussy <laughs> just because i don't remember why <laughs> That, oh, that's the one where she's she's doing the rehearsal and um, she has to keep doing it again and again and she winds up hurting herself. There's like that excruciating rehearsal yeah. and her feet get all bloody and yeah. Yeah, and the she's doing a dance number for a music video and the commentary from the other characters who are on set are saying things like, are the male dancers out femming her? Do they seem too gay? Yeah, they're male dancers right, in a music yeah. video. Of course they're going to seem gay. What are you talking about? You act like you're not <laughs> in this industry. What are you talking about? Yeah. Every fucking male dancer in every fucking music video seem gay. Most of the humor slash commentary <laughs> is kind of relegated to those like producer side characters. They're all like really snarky, really cynical. Like Hank Azaria has like, you know, and Eli oh, yeah. Roth even comes in as one of them and they've got, you know, the typical kind of greedy producer type lines. It's like the most obvious part of the commentary, I'd say. Um, but it just doesn't gel with anything else. It's not a consistent tone. It's like what you, not you probably could have made this way more over the top, way more exaggerated, and everyone is like more of an unlikable caricature. But then you can't spin around and try and have like an emotional resonance at the heart of that. Like it's just yeah, so confused. They tried any consistency. The entire they episode, did, she was like tried a little bit. She was like, "My mom died of cancer. We didn't show it. Also, she beat me." And I'm sad that I have to dance. And it was very yeah. over dramatic. <laughs> yeah, big time. That was that was another thing that was theorized to have been cut from that original. It might have been the sixth episode, actually. Um, there were all these images that came out from that original uh, original version, the Simets version, um, that seemed to have a lot of scenes with a young Lily Rose Depp character and maybe showing the backstory a little bit and fla- a flashback of some kind to do with when she was young, which probably could have helped to uh, cement or at least give this a bit of direction. Or yeah. Cause we don't get context. any context. She kind of just insists it yeah. and we never see anything. And then, so yeah. immediately the entire time I'm like, is she lying? Cause we don't see it. You know, it's like fucking mm-hmm. just the most obvious thing in the world. <laughs> and they yeah. try to do it as a twist on the last episode. It's like, okay, well I was <laughs> thinking that, the entire time <laughs> so it's not really a twist yeah. that's one of the only things that makes anything make any semblance of sense and even then it's still ridiculous yeah at the end of episode two we find out she likes breath play and the weekend just knew that i guess yeah because that's a know, very important was bit oh is this the one with the famous line with the uh I want you to stretch your beep. <laughs> I don't. You know, it's like close up on his face and he's like whispering that line, trying to be as hot as possible. And there was, like yeah. The funniest, the funniest thing you've ever seen. There was some cringe shit. I, I wrote down a timestamp for when he's saying, oh yeah, just like that baby. And then in all caps, I say, <laughs> oh God, the cringe. The weekend is so fucking bad. 
<laughs> and that was episode two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the pa- the pacing is just so slow. Like, no matter what you were trying to do with the writing, certainly at some point they sh- they could have realized, wait, nothing's happening this entire... Like, by the end of episode two, you have, you know, what would be in a normal show the first 20 minutes, not the first two hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you, yeah, there's no urgency or like really any ticking time element. There's no. They're just dawdling. No tension. Dicking around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's utterly glacial. Like no, nothing really happens. Nothing at all. You you could easily cut this down to like an hour twenty, probably. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The entire thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I reckon easily. Yeah. Episode three. They go to a store, and the weekend's like, you see that girl? Is there anything in the store that's as beautiful as she is? It's like, okay, you're such a turd. <laughs> Where, yeah, he fronts up against that guy. Yeah, if you're if you're selling things in the store, like what do you say? There's nothing as beautiful as she is. Or yes, we have lots. <laughs> or like what 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 yeah. is that supposed to? You're just torturing <laughs> that customer service worker. And again, it's like what you're trying to make him. You're obviously trying to make him look bad, and like a an asshole. Mm-hmm. But like, where do they take that as far as the character? Nowhere. Like he's so static. Yeah, like he doesn't really learn or change or doesn't really impact the other character. Like, it's like, what? Okay. So it's just it's just the weekend trying to show off how aggressive and intimidating he can be for his lady. Oh, my God. <laughs> so here's, here's an important one that I feel kind of is representative of, like, some of the issues I have with the show uh, as a whole and, like, the, the, the main character in the commentary on art. So halfway through episode three, which is, like, the shortest episode, there's a girl character who... Seems to be like as the show progresses, she's shown as like, I guess, the pure artist, um, you know, the younger character, I, I think, is who says this. Oh, you're talking so, about the um, the K-pop star? No, I'm talking about the one who gets the oh, really? uh, the pep talk from the large uh, black woman um, about like, oh, she's, yeah, I know yeah, the you're younger about. character. Yeah. With the, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she just seems like so much more naturally talented. But I, th- I think this is the same character. I, I didn't specify in my notes, but... At, at halfway through episode three, this character has to explain to the main character who is who is a professional musician with backup dancers and like a label and mm-hmm. all that shit, who has to explain to her, you can take sad life experiences and transform them into art. And it, <laughs> and it was like seen as some sort of revelation. Like, why would you need that explained to you? What are you what have you been doing as an artist this entire time? What is your art? What are you? You're not, you're not expressing anything, and it's like it's so, so shallow, so shallow. Like, how do yeah. how am I supposed to relate to this character? What was her whole attribute? She was like taken in by the weekend, and it's revealed. She like she's asked her age, and she slips up, and she's younger than she says she is, and that never really comes to her yeah. head or anything. Um, again, this is like a, <laughs> it's just more for the pile for the how bad of a person the weekend character is. So they just keep piling on this evidence of like why you shouldn't like this guy. Yeah. Only to then turn it around at the end and be like, aren't you happy that this love story True love concluded wins. this way? <laughs> yeah. It's like, what? No, this guy is like a monster. Yeah. Why are you- <laughs> Always return to your abusers. Always go back to your toxic relationships because there's nothing else outside yeah. of that. And, and are they trying to have like moral. the ironic slump where they're like on on the stage with like thousands of people screaming for it and it's supposed to be like an ironic celebration. I don't know. If I, that was the intent, it does not come through. Yeah, it does not come through at all. Yeah. So they talk at a table for what feels like five hours, but it's only the end of episode three. <laughs> Just <laughs> 45 minute long episode. Yeah, they have like it's really important. That that whole table I, thing, like, yeah, it's a big deal. Really, this uh, dialogue's important. Not respectful with our time at all. <laughs> oh no, no, no! Not self-aware. They, they, that's where they kind of they establish uh, the Troy Savan character, who is like a a former YouTuber apparently as well. He does like oh yeah stuff on music on YouTube. There are a few of those in the cast. That's why I mentioned the the K-pop star as well. Oh yeah, um, she's like a huge I had in no one idea. of these huge K-pop bands. Yeah, and this guy, uh, uh, Moses Sumney as well, does music. Uh, there's like a bunch of like yeah pop stars in in the cast. Um, but this th- they establish in that episode this this guy Troy Savan is like 
Lily Rose Depp's long-term friend who kind of feels like he's been slighted by her success and she only keeps him around to kind of put him down. Um, that's where they kind of establish that and you get the funny torture scene in the following episode. Yeah, um, episode four. Can put a pin in for a second? Yeah. Yeah, so in my notes I have at the beginning, well, 11 minutes through it, who knows what happened in the first 10 minutes. The first good scene in the entire show was the black woman kind of instructing the random cocaine child <laughs> how to properly sing. And they had like a really nice conversation and it felt genuine and it felt pure and i was like damn like if the rest of the show was like this could have been cool yeah 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 lily rose depp is recording the weekend is like she needs to sound less boring i know what to do i'm gonna fuck her while she's singing mm -hmm. so she's not a real, real artist you have to trick her into performing properly <laughs> by by fucking yeah. her <laughs> and it was really cringeworthy <laughs> and disgusting <laughs> Yeah, it is disgusting. They do that a few times, don't they? He's like putting blindfolds on her and trying to get unique sounds out of her while, while recording. Yeah. It's so stupid. It, well, what are we supposed to get out of that? What are we supposed to get? Yeah, it, it's like He's 50 Shades level. It's just like, <laughs> yeah, it just feels like softcore porn, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so later in this episode, they have kind of like a fake out horror scene where the weekend is like sneaking up on the gay shower boy it was like oh i'm sneaking up i'm gonna kill you and then later they put a shot collar on him and the, kidnap yeah, him. The torture scene. <laughs> it's because he didn't tell other people that her mom was abusive <laughs> even though she turned out yeah, not basically. to be and so they torture and kidnap this character that they're all they have this weird fucking i don't know commune like it's this cult yeah i think now. it's supposed to be a cult but they do like a really bad job of just communicating that fear angle because then after that scene that character is pretty much indoctrinated into he's the cult fine. and then it's like a he's a lackey after that yeah you know? it, like they kidnapped and tortured him and then he's like chilling with him like they're friends after that for some reason <laughs> yeah yeah he's loving it after that <laughs> yeah yeah then there's the the love triangle element where uh it devolves into this boring lily rose depp versus the weekend because that that K-pop character comes into the equation and Lily Rose Depp gets jealous of her. So to get revenge, because uh, The weekend used to be with this K-pop girl. Um, so then her coming back and being all cutesy in front of Lily Rose Depp makes her jealous. So then she calls up her ex, who happens to be acting in a superhero movie that's coming out. Um, so then she organizes for him to be framed. Yeah. Yeah. Which is very bizarre. <laughs> that whole like fake framing, like, oh, you raped me. Here's the evidence. It's a photo that we took on the stairs, which mm -hmm. should have some metadata in it to prove when it was taken, by the way. They never address that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, which, which should have, you should have that, you know, if you want to just prove where the photo originates. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. But it just amounts to nothing. We got Eli Roth showing back up in the show, and they're all performing in front of these record executives, these big wigs at the music company. And uh, on the last episode, yeah, we're on episode one. five. There, not yeah, nothing yeah. else happened in episode four, according to my notes. No, no, nope. <laughs> no, nothing really did. No, th this whole sequence, man. Ah. Oh. It's, it's, it's one of the most excruciating parts for me. It's very long. Yeah, and it's in the, it's the best example of the the whole producer. You see in this, they, they come into the scene at first and they're all like, oh, what is this? What is going on? What is this mess? But then as they start playing the music, they're like one over and you're supposed yeah. to be right there with them. And it's like, oh my God, it's so, it's so embarrassing. It's so difficult to sit through. I have some quotes from Eli Roth. This is 39 minutes through, so who knows what happened in the first fucking 40 <laughs> minutes. He says, that was the best music you've ever made. All the pain you went through was worth it. All the pain with your mom, etc. And even though she didn't mention her mom in the song, but it's just like, it, yeah. he's insisting, the show is insisting that it's shining through somehow and that she finally channeled her pain into art, which never, it doesn't feel that way in the art that they're showing at all. 
<laughs> no. Because they, I guess they don't know how to do that. I guess The Weeknd doesn't know how to write that kind of music. Not, not surprising. And there's a really cringe line where Eli Ross says, oh, yeah, when you're riding the invisible horse cock, you're totally chan channeling your dead cancer mom's energy. That was paraphrasing. I don't know if he actually said that or if that was my interpretation. But she was <laughs> 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 she was basically doing like a stripper dance. And it's like, well, how is this like what the, 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 the song completely removed from what they're insisting it's about or they're insisting it's inspired by. It just seems like a oh you want to fuck me I'm I'm bad song yeah like that that's that that's the tone and the presentation and the lyrics and everything and like she's she's literally just doing a fucking like the, sex yeah. dance it, <laughs> like what does this have to do with cancer mom basically it's just a lap dance yeah that's what sucks because it's like man the, the the room for commentary there is is huge you know like you could she's clearly already kind of based around like a Britney Spears kind of child star type character and yeah you could you could uh, embody tons of commentary about like the way we sexualize pop stars at this level you know uh, regardless of age and all this kind of stuff but they, they don't even like veer towards it or they kind of do they'll just have one of the producers say something so overt and without an ounce of subtlety it's like just explaining anything any anything of uh, substance yeah. just then and there spitting it out so, but yeah yeah what happens next? There, we get a scene with the other girl that's supposed to have the record deal. Yeah. And they're like, sorry, you can't sing the song legally because we're giving it to the other girl. So they suggest, why, yeah, don't, that's right. why don't you write something of your own? Uh, you can write it about this legal issue. Yeah. And they suggest that. And she's like, okay. And I don't know why anyone would say that or why they're just treating it like that's cool. What the resolution of that is or what the point is. It's like there was a line missing or something. Uh, yeah, I think what they were trying to do with that B plot was they, they start setting her up to kind of be a Lily Rose Depp replacement because through all the... In the background, the producers are seeing all the turmoil and the cult stuff with Lily Rose Depp, and they're starting to lose confidence in her. Um, so, yeah, they start organizing her replacement in the background, but then things start working out a couple of yeah. episodes later okay. for Lily Rose Depp, and they start getting impressed. So then they just drop the the B character, I guess, as to try and say how ruthless and cutthroat and however all well, the producers are liars and yeah. you can't trust anyone in this industry yada 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 she's actually fantastic now that we've tricked her by having sex with now that her we think we've tricked her when in fact she's actually tricked all of us yeah <laughs> which is weird and it doesn't make any sense so like he's got this fucking this cult of artists that are just super fucking talented now without us ever <laughs> seeing anything from the weekend to justify him making them talented. Yeah. We never see him like teaching them in any significant or important way. He just fucks her. And the other characters, we don't yeah. know how they got talented, but he gets all the credit yeah. and all the producers are like, you're clearly a genius. You're clearly a genius because you That's found true. all these people. Like, I don't, what? If you replaced all of the gratuitous sex scenes with like cleverly written scenes of him being more of like a mentor kind of maybe trying to guide that music production, then maybe, maybe you get a little bit more of that and actually see why she'd like him a bit more or get the use out of him. Whereas, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he taught that. them so many valuable life skills. But you just fuck on the mic. That's what you do. You make good music. <laughs> yeah, because he's supposed to be kind of like a life coach type person as well. Yeah. Like this wise no, or yeah, that, it, that really doesn't come it, through. <laughs> what's crazy about it is, so... This is this is the final episode. There were supposed to be six. Let's just assume episode five and six, even let I don't know somewhere between four and six was trimmed down into just two episodes, or maybe five and six was trimmed down into one episode. There's stuff yeah. missing from the end half. Even considering that, there's it, it feels like there's entire setups and scenes and con pe large chunks of context that are missing from the first half, even before they started cutting it down. Like him yeah. being a mentor, like him teaching them, or like anything to justify why these music producers and executives would be saying 
these positive things about him. Like, th- we don't get any of that. Throughout the entire scene in this last episode, he looks like he's fucking six shots and six bars in. Like, he, he's on <laughs> some mix of, of, like, alcohol and prescription medications. But we never see him take any of it. Yeah. He just kind of shows up and he's like... Like, looking greasy yeah, and angry and stuff. And it's like, whiskey. okay, are yeah. we... Did we miss something? Like, there, there could have been a scene... You know, where we saw him maybe breaking down and like going for the bottle or something like that. But it it felt like there was just chunks of it missing, which you should not feel in a show that's so fucking slow because all it Mm -hmm. reveals is that, oh, hey, you did have time to show this. Clearly, you wasted a lot of time. Yeah. So, so why didn't we see any of it? Like, you should never feel like you're missing context or missing scenes or missing motivations in a show that that is this painfully slow and doesn't <laughs> not seem to value anyone's time whatsoever. Absolutely baffling. And and also, I'm going to point this out: the whole rise to stardom aspect of this, where she's like, "Oh, now I'm in a big crowd, and I finally get what I want because uh, I'm the big musician." It's like the ca- you started out having a record deal and fucking filming music videos and backup dancers. You didn't start from shit. You were already in the industry. You were already making music. You already had a job doing yeah. that. You already had a fucking huge fan following of some sort for you to be like uh, in this tabloid yeah. cum face Most thing. Most scenes like, are in a mansion. Yeah. Like you already have a mansion. So it's like, oh, the 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 great struggle and the the, the breaking through as this character's achievement is now she can afford three pools instead of two pools. Now she has a house with three (laughs) pools or some shit. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? This isn't any kind of a success story at all. It's just pure narcissism, which, I mean, if this is The weekend's fucking passion project, then no shit. Like, how how does he write anything? Yeah. (laughs) Why why didn't he just make himself the main character, is my question. If, like, if you you hated having this whole, because that was the... The original, uh, the way it's been described in like these articles, saying that he he didn't get on with the female perspective the show was leaning into, despite having Lily Rose Depp as the main character as the pop star with originally this female director, and he was like surprised that it was leaning that way. And I said, like, "Well, why don't you just make it about you then? You know? Like, yeah. Why? What are you like, fucking if, trying to do? Yeah, <laughs> like what, what do you actually want to say with this? You just want to, you just want to look cool, even though you're playing like a horrible, aggressive like ex pimp guy who's clearly a bad person by like any metric. <laughs> like, I guess you think that's cool. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah the the show concludes. She's got a big show. She can afford a house with three pools instead of two pools now. And she's got millions more fans than the millions she already had, which is such a fant- amazing achievement. That's right. There's a really awkward time jump. Yeah. Like, yeah. The time jumps like six months or something. The producers pay the weekend to, they're, they're like, okay, you're genius. Uh, we're going to pay you money to just never interact with us again. And then he shows up at the concert, I guess, like before it started. Uh, tries to like sneak in and then she's like let him in I love him and she's like also my mom never beat me and I lied about everything but we're together again and the <laughs> producers are like what we what and yeah I don't know what I'm supposed to interpret or feel for that matter <laughs> yes yeah, right because about, about any of this. yeah like 20 or 30 <laughs> minutes into that episode the like producer characters kind of get together and they, they they like team up with the press to like sabotage the weekend's character somehow through whatever channels and power they've got. So then, yeah, he's like humiliated at the end and then shows up to the show. He tries his pimp name when they're asking for like the name on the list and that doesn't work. But then he says his real name, I guess to say just how well they know each other. And that gets him in. It's true um, love. Backstage. And then, then yeah, he picks up the hairbrush, realizes, oh, the hairbrush is brand new. So this story about the beatings could not be true, huh? And then she kind of like winks right at the camera. And then they have to. Oh, yeah. What did the hairbrush show. have to do with it? Um, that was supposed to be like the 
the instigator for him realizing that the the in the previous episodes, like that big table scene in episode three, I think, um, she uh, brings up that her mum used to beat her with her hairbrush, and there are a bunch of sh- scenes showing her brush her hair with that hairbrush to kind of show like it's her living on somehow, and you know, it's like a symbol of her mother that, and her power over her. Um, but yeah, it wasn't true because it's a brand new hairbrush and has no marks of any kind on it. Yeah. And then the show's over and it was a big waste of four and a half hours or some shit. Yep. Four and a half hours. (laughs) Yeah. Nothing happened. It was so (laughs) stupid. But it was like, it was exactly just one of those, you know, train wreck car crash movies where like I was addicted to it. I was like, it was fascinating. It was genuinely fascinating. Just how unrelatable it was and how confused it was and to imagine (laughs) that this was someone ostensibly trying to say something like the weekend this was his project and he was like yeah i want to communicate this it's like well i don't know what you really wanted to communicate did you just want to fuck lily rose depp and that was you just wanted to have some scenes where you were having sex with her and that's the (laughs) whole thing and that's the all the, the entire reason why you made this and why you didn't want Amy Simons's version? Like, I want to know what that was. Surely it would have I been better than was, this. Yeah. Like, you, it, it would be impossible for that not to have been better than this. What do you think about the just the production and the presentation in terms of, especially comparing it to Euphoria? Because like one of the big missed opportunities to me was like, well, how much how much fun and room do you have for creativity when you've got? A, a ton of like drug use and B, like a cult. And you could have so much fun and like with the colors and the imagery and uh, kind of more trippy sequences like in Euphoria when like Rue going down a hallway and it starts spinning and she falls onto the ceiling while it's spinning. But every other character like stays stuck to the ground as like cool imagery and stuff to like bring you into a scene or put you there with a the character. That they yeah. do nothing, nothing like that. None of it. None. none. What's like the most creative none scene? At all. There, I don't think there's there is no anything. creative scene. There is no creative scene. <laughs> it's just, it's so blunt. It's boringly shot. Yeah. And there's like two Stagnant. or three locations throughout the entire thing. Not inherently a problem, but again, it's just how it was used. Like it's, it's all in favor and in service of these embarrassing exchanges of dialogue. <laughs> yeah. It's. Like, it's, what, what, it's what? Dumb and pretentious at the same time. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. trying to insist something without having the tools or brains <laughs> to, to be able to mm-hmm. actually portray what you're insisting you're trying to portray. So it's just a big fucking mess. It's a big disaster. It's a disaster piece. <laughs> <laughs> so... I'd lo- I'd yeah. love to know what they they spent overall. Um, cause it couldn't have been cheap. Like even though it is in the weekend's mansion, and you can't really get over the fact that it was like seventy percent shot or whatever it was. So like, that's yeah. a lot of time. That's a lot of production money. Scrapping all that, having to get these people in last minute. Sam Levinson taking over on all that direction and writing. I don't know why they didn't. Man, I suppose they could have just scrapped it, but. Why not just give it more time? You know, it's like you're the it's like you're the biggest pop star in the world. You have all these names attached. Like, can you not just? I, I'm just struggling to like <laughs> come up with excuses for how it wound up this bad. You know, with all the names involved, with all the power. It's because he was in charge. It's it's his fault. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the irony. Like, he's definitely rich. He could bankroll this entire production and spend as much time as he wanted. Surely, you know. This might be exactly what he wanted to make. This might be the unchanged. <laughs> just, yeah. this, this, this is a one-to-one his vision and the project. <laughs> and his vision was just shit and dumb. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's what it needed to be then. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know if he's taken away the right conclusions from this um, based on his response. But Oh, what did he say? Um, just this, these tirades of tweets and Instagram posts. Um, I'll see if I can send you any right now. Cause they are, they are funny. Oh, there's whole like articles, like a, a collection of the weekend's wildest, the idle tweets so far. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. Like tagging Rolling Stone cause of that cringy scene where he's like, 
trying to shit on old media. That's right. And I've forgotten how just how oh self inserted this is. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, these are so much more embarrassing than I even remember. <laughs> He thinks that Rolling Stone gave it a bad review because there's a line in the show where him as his own character, him as himself, I guess, but not really, but kind of, he says, isn't Rolling Stone irrelevant? So he thinks that he upset the entity known as Rolling Stone and that secretly it was a great show and they're just pretending that it wasn't because they were personally offended that he said that they were irrelevant as the character in the show is yes. what it seems to be <laughs> him tagging at rolling stone did we upset you and then just a clip from the show wow <laughs> <laughs> that's very funny um what and then um there was like an article <laughs> of lily rose depp being interviewed and she described it like oh i I knew it was going to be controversial and I just didn't want to make something, you know, puritanical, like all this kind of stuff. It's like, it's just missing the forest for the trees. I don't think, I don't think anyone would care about like the excess and the sex and the drug use and all this stuff that are considered controversial topics if it was just done well. I don't think anyone would be complaining otherwise. Yeah. I wonder if it made money because a lot of people watched it to shit on it, you know? But yeah. then, then why would they cut down an entire? Why, why would they cut out an entire episode's worth? Is the real question. Why would they do that? Why would they? Yeah, the weekend made a bunch of music for it. Lily Rose Depp released those songs for it. It yeah. is big on TikTok. I don't know. Maybe, yeah, it got maybe got enough hate watches for it to come together in the end. Day. It was the know. most popular show online for the th for three weeks in a row. Is what one of these things says. It was beating Black Mirror makes sense yeah i never know like how much it translates though as far as people mocking something online to actually making a company money you know like morbius they tried that right they tried like releasing it again but then it just yeah but people didn't <laughs> watch it made anything. <laughs> yeah exactly people were exactly, clowning on so the like... clips that other people were uploading from the movie <laughs> and nobody actually bought a ticket to the movie people were yeah. just people were just sharing morb memes Whereas like this, when, when something's as easy to access as just clicking a button on a fucking a subscription service that you might already have or, you know, yeah. that you can get a free trial for, a lot of people will just watch it. And according to the people running the streaming service, it's just engagement, right? That's all they care about. They don't care if the reviews are good. So it's really confusing why they would delete an episode when, you know, same platform renewed Velma for a second season obviously that got popular from all the hate watches and they're just like oh let's do it again oh right did that they, actually get renewed I'm pretty I sure didn't hear about that yeah let's check wow got hate watched into a second season huh yeah it's the same with like Big Mouth I guess it's got like 40 seasons now yeah it's it's renewed <laughs> Velma has the season two <laughs> but it's it, like it's like maybe one of the worst rated shows ever like so it's interesting yeah. that they didn't go that same route with this they decided that show yeah that show actually seemed made to be engagement bait where <laughs> I don't know, the idol seems just more like a just an utter failure you know just like <laughs> nothing came God together damn. what does he do like so he writes this character a lot of his tweets are like oh look at this scumbag but it's also like a smiley devil emote emoji or whatever yeah, he thinks it's he's cool doing. he thinks yeah. it's cool he thinks he's fucking cool so it's like okay well is the point like like is he a scumbag that you're supposed to think is awesome because that like this last tweet in that article that you sent me <laughs> the ted russi getting comfy in this girl crib the takeover real hashtag the idol and it's just a photo of him like fucking spread eagle <laughs> on a on a couch like what are we supposed to why did they write him to be so, like, comedically evil then? You know? I think he's got, like, no self-awareness. Because <laughs> you could write that, like, someone who's made mistakes in his past and has been to prison or whatever doesn't make you inherently irredeemable. But, like, they go out of their way to, like, put details on it that, like, <laughs> that really I explain the brutality and explain, like, the, 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 the way he preys on people. It's, it's like a... 
I'm glad you think that's cool, man, but I don't know if it, <laughs> if Very it really cool. lands the way you think it lands. Yeah. <laughs> like, he, thi he thinks he's created memorable characters. He thinks he's created something <laughs> that is, like, culturally significant. It's very embarrassing. Oh, so embarrassing. I don't I don't know what kind of character he thinks he made. There's very few people in the world I think are ugly. <laughs> the mm -hmm. weekend the weekend is one of them. <laughs> and I, I didn't think that before watching the show because I, I don't know. I just never saw too much of him. But like I don't know. The way he looked in this show was just disgusting. He looks like the mm -hmm. greasiest fucking guy of all time. <laughs> but so yeah. But the, that, that sounds like a fun character when you describe it like that, but it's not, it doesn't come across yeah, like that. Yeah, you know, it? fucking, I don't know, James Franco in Spring Breakers. That's a fun character. He's a scumbag. Yeah. But he's like, mm -hmm. he, he, you know, you could quote him. There's a, there's a comedic aspect to it. It seems to be entirely self-aware with what it's doing and mm -hmm. what it is. And that's a fun, memorable character. Whereas this this, like... If no one can even pinpoint what the fuck we're supposed to get out of this, <laughs> what are we? I don't know. I we. I'm glad we went over the the plot because I needed a good refresher of just how stupid this was. But yeah, genuinely fascinating show. Maybe legitimately the worst show I've ever seen ever of all time. <laughs> Maybe quite possibly uh, I, legitimately ooh. the worst show I've ever seen ever. I don't know if I can think of a worse one. I think it's up there for me. Uh, only it's close to some of those certain reasons why seasons in my head, as far as like I don't know, just romanticizing these bad concepts, being boring, <laughs> being trying to be like a drama, but but wind up being this like hilarious melodrama. Um, <laughs> like I don't know, it's pretty close to certain reasons why in my mind. Um, but... This is way more incomprehensible and boring. That's the thing, though. It's, it's different. 13 Reasons Why was funny. <laughs> it it was does really just funny. get funnier and funnier the more it comes along. Uh, that is definitely true. Uh, it's just, man, the names attached to this, there, there really is just no excuse. There's none, man. Like, the, this is like a powerhouse production, an HBO show with, like, the biggest pop stars with the writing director of Euphoria. Like, there's no... Yeah. There's no reason now to be this level. This level. You know, like... We're getting closer and closer to the Sam Levinson's a hack realization. <laughs> I'm yeah. giving him, like, maybe one more chance. I think I, I'm not expecting much from whatever the fuck I see from him next is, is my issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I liked Euphoria season one a lot. We both did, but... Yeah, the Nepo baby. Yeah. He seems... Uh, very confused now. Mm hmm Because I know, like, that was that was the impetus for Euphoria, wasn't it? Like, it was kind of loosely based on his experiences growing up in L.A. in that kind of drug-riddled environment. Yeah. And maybe that now that that story's kind of been told, like, I don't know if he knows where to take it, clearly, yeah. otherwise. And then now we get a show based on The weekend's experiences of being a greasy piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> all right one out of ten this fuck this show it's so bad it's yeah, horrendous yeah. yeah one out of ten genuinely probably the worst show i've ever seen in my entire life well, yeah words can't even really they can't even do justice like how awful this this project is <laughs> like it really is a failure you feel gross watching it mm-hmm yeah it yeah, premiered at con <laughs> <laughs> really? They, That's hilarious. They, they premiered oh a God. couple episodes at Con. <laughs> this I, this like a standing it thought it was going to be like an art piece. They're like, this is going to be challenging. This is going to be a very challenging, That's what, very. That's art. where the pretentious side comes in, though. This is like a French film. It's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess no one can say no to the weekend, huh? They should Don't start lose your job. <laughs> they should start saying no to the week. They definitely should start. <laughs> All right. There was a film recommendation for this episode, as every episode has one. Uh, Old Boy, 2003 film, not to be confused with the terrible 2013 remake. <laughs> this is a much uh, better film, which is also, it's based on a manga, but this is a very yeah. sensible and very 
expertly made, expertly directed, expertly written and acted. Fucking masterpiece of a movie. It's one of my uh, favorites, and it's a great way to introduce people to Korean cinema, which is now, yes. you know, getting a lot more popular on the world stage at this point in time. Um, but there have been great Korean movies for a while. So this movie was in 2003, released in 2003. And it follows a man named Odessu, and he becomes imprisoned for 15 years in an unknown location, and he doesn't know why, and he doesn't know who kidnapped him or why he's there, or even that he would be there for 15 years. And the story is essentially a revenge story of him trying to figure out who did it, uh, getting revenge on them, and it's more complex than that. This is a spoiler discussion, so if you haven't seen Old Boy 2003, please watch it and come back because it is one of the best movies ever, and it is very spoilable. This is a movie you can spoil. Yeah, yeah, There's, it's definitely one of those. Yeah, you know, reveals and yeah, it's a great plot. It's a great plot, and uh, it is a great plot. Very, very well executed overall. And the reason I recommended it is because uh, Neon's doing a uh, 4K restoration theatrical release. It might still be in theaters by the time this episode is out. I have no idea how long they're planning on keeping it in theaters, but I made sure to let everybody know what the recommendation would be, like two episodes early, just because that's when it would be in theaters. We were recording. We're recording a few of these early because. Tiff is coming up and uh, going to be out of town, going to be busy. So uh, what did you think of Old Boy, Alex? Love it. Um, I was obviously pretty familiar with this one already, but I feel like the rewatch I had was, was pretty much perfect. Not only the 4K um, being as crisp and clean as it is, but also I watched it with someone who hadn't seen it before so i had the, the i could live vicariously through them and mm -hmm. the obvious like twist reveal moments and it kind of experienced that again but yeah it was just as good as i remembered it obviously uh well i noticed a lot more of the detail a lot more of that foreshadowing some of the some of the themes they were going for some of this uh just this whole revenge angle and these 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 two boys and the way their their lives overlap um and the the mirror that echoes there it's uh, you mentioned the manga. Um, I haven't read it, but uh, and I think it's only kind of loosely based off it because I think it's it's fairly long. Yeah, definitely turned it into its own thing. Definitely, yeah. But a lot of the the imagery and the visuals they they do sit in my head head like a particularly striking page from a manga or a graphic novel or something like this. Just very well, uh, kind of paced and storyboarded, and just so many like classic great moments. Very brisk as well, actually. Like it just, it just flies by. It doesn't like it. It's, it doesn't really take the oomph or wind out of its sails, knowing the twist reveals that are coming. Um, in mm -hmm. fact, it's kind of the opposite. You getting to see it again is like a sixth sense slash Fight Club type tier story, where yeah, just just figuring out what's going on only gets better. The more you rewatch it, the more you can comb over the details and what is being set up and. It really is just like this gross Greek tragedy in the end. That's like the heart yeah. of it, I guess. It's it's pre it's pretty brutal. It's not this ain't no happy ending kind of movie. It's 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 pretty miserable. Like the places it goes, the the themes it explores. Like man, just even how, how do you dance around it? Like you, you kind of have to go straight there. Yeah. The, <laughs> <laughs> incest, I guess, being like the big theme of the movie, one of the big themes. And the, yeah, the the intertwining uh, like espionage type story with the whole old boy referencing the this school that the main character had forgotten about, and the the, the like irony of him discovering this guy uh, getting a little bit too close to his sister, and then blabbing about it at school, and these rumors that go out of control, and by the end it winds up him cutting the tongue out of his mouth. It's like a symbol. I'm like dancing all over the place. I don't know if you want to focus on a specific part right now because my mind's like scattershot. I know. It's, it's a, I absolutely loved it. It's kind of difficult to talk about, but we'll try our best because there's just so much going on. What I love about this film, one of the many things I love about this film, is that unlike other, you know, great revenge or, you know, uh, 
mystery, action, suspense, whatever we want to call it, uh, epic stories. This is one where by the end of it, you you feel really bad for the villain, right? Like mm-hmm. Wu Jin, like you understand why he would want to get that revenge on someone, you know, and he even says at the end, like my sister and I loved each other despite everything. Can you do the same? You know, re- regardless of whatever sort of moral implications we want to make about incest, like to this character, he lost, I guess, his lover, but also his sister. You know, either way, he's got to care about her. She ended her life because of the rumors that had spread about her that, you know, even the main character, Odessu, he <laughs> he tells his friend, like, don't blab to anybody. He only told one person, but it spiraled out of control from there. Yeah. Uh, completely out of his control and he winds up even taking responsibility like he the the just terrifyingly cruel things that happen to the characters throughout this movie both emotionally and physically it's just a a a very engaging and very powerful punch to be watching every single reveal every single physical moment for for odessu to cut out his own tongue literally but Mm -hmm. for you know also symbolic purposes he's not even told to do it to see to see desperation captured in such an extreme way that i I don't know how i could ever write something like that like you have to go really deep into these dark parts of your mind to come up with some of these things (laughs) like you have to you have to really get in there and just think of like the the most brutal or uh, the worst things you could imagine happening to these characters, but not in like a, you know, not in a particularly cynical or exploitative way. It's not like a Serbian film where the whole point is just to shock you. This is something where even though what you're seeing is shocking, it feels appropriate and fitting and emotionally resonant and thematically resonant for the film. It's 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 well, one yeah. of those movies where like the pieces just fit and you understand why every scene is there. You understand why it's shot in a certain way. You understand everything about it and it just it everything complements the entire experience. Yeah. And it's fun to take this character who, from our perspective, I guess, has been he's been wronged to such an extreme level, you know, put in like solitary confinement pretty much for fifteen years. Like it would, it would make anyone snap. It would make anyone go crazy. So you're right there with him, trying to figure out, like, why was he put here? Like, how could how could you possibly give someone a motivation that would explain them going to these lengths and mm-hmm. let let alone give them any kind of depth or like relatability? But then that scene happens. Just the execution of it from the second that first page of the that book, uh, the the photo album starts being flicked and the music starts rising and you start realizing. So, yeah, oh I've God, got the music is... in my head right now. I've got the visuals <laughs> yeah, and the music. It's... it's so memorable. It's like snapshots of the movie that, that are just, it, yeah. it sticks with you. You remember exactly what the shot looks like and exactly what the music sounds like. Like, I don't know. I've seen it a lot of times. And the feeling so of it. It's, it's like it. an emotionally overwhelming moment. Like, it's, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not feeling happy. I'm not feeling sad. I'm just feeling like, Oh my god! I'm right here with this character feeling what he's feeling. Like the almost makes you feel ill. Like yeah, the, <laughs> and the, and the way he expresses it, and like it just the, he degrades himself to such a level. You're right there with him. You're buying that this it, it's such an overwhelmingly negative thing to find out. Like I, I feel like it probably would break anyone. You yeah, know, to to get that information revealed to you, um, it's like such a. It is so deeply horrifying, it's so psychologically messed up, and then the reaction of him laughing into a handkerchief while he's... Perfect. He's like the lowest point. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very engaging, a very messed up, uh, horrifying way for the story to kind of conclude. Um, yeah release reach and then and then all the like layers of complication in there where the the guy who put him in the prison whose sister committed suicide he, it's kind of been the only thing keeping him going because like once once he reveals exactly. to the main character it becomes um, his obsession yeah and there's this whole he's had this heart surgery he's got a funky heart and he's got this little device that he says will end his heart if the button is pressed 
handing it to him as he walks out saying you can just kill me like it's over um <laughs> but then like that final cherry on top like the button doesn't kill him at all it's just linked to an audio recording of him and his daughter having sex it's yeah like oh my god how can it how can it get any more brutal right now um but it is like it is it's quite an interesting conundrum because I, I don't know what it's trying to say in terms of like i don't i don't, I don't think the punishment necessarily meets the crime with how like extreme it is but just showing the i guess you would call them the villains kind of perspective mm -hmm. um that connection with his sister and where it goes and uh the way they kind of reintegrate all this imagery of like the opening moment where he's hanging that guy uh the suicidal guy by his tie off yeah. the cliff just like how the villain character is hanging his sister off the bridge trying to stop her and in, in, including these little details, uh, which we can get more into, like the phantom pregnancy angle mm -hmm. um, and the rumors and the, the hypnotism angle, that does turn it into this like quite complicated man. Yeah, you you do see at least where the villain's coming from. Like as you see his motivation, and you can understand it to a certain degree. Um, I I don't know about the <laughs> the, the lengths, level of sadistic yeah. torture <laughs> that it goes to. Um, clearly, but uh, just on an emotional level, you can understand. Yeah, yeah. That this, yeah, it was a huge deal to him, and yeah, the the way he sees it is understandable at a certain level, and that's that's an interesting thing to like bring out of you because it is it is such an extreme situation that he's forced them in character into so yeah getting that level of explanation and it being like oh okay this is like really dark this is really fucked up but man i kind of see where you're coming from <laughs> some of these angles this is yeah this is horrifying like that it's also really convincing when um when the main character gets together with his his friend from the opening scene um, he comes to pick him up from the prison um, and the villain character when he hears him talking about his sister calling her a slut and mm -hmm. all this derogatory stuff the way he just pounces on him and beats him to death with a floppy disk or whatever it is yeah it was just a yeah a lot of great acting in here really really selling the uh it's so emotionally charged and it, it you know just talking about like the idol and how <laughs> the intensity of these characters is poorly conveyed this is like a great example of just bringing that intensity that is required for this this vengeance to matter for it to mean something yeah. for it to have weight behind it there you can you can tell that there's so much faith in the project from everyone oh. involved they all they all believe in it they all know that it's something worth expressing and worth exploring the the casting is fantastic you know like yeah uh Jin is <laughs> You know, it, it's it's not it doesn't feel like an anime villain, but you still see the really twisted and fucked up nature that y you could even argue is maybe a bit over the top, but it, it, it still feels grounded and it still feels real. And it's still like he's a very disturbed, broken character that is getting obviously sick satisfaction out of this vengeance, which I mean the main character that's his goal too uh odessa is al yeah. also motivated by vengeance and i also want to point out choi min shik and also his friend character they went through pretty extreme weight transformations over the 15 years yeah, true in the story as actors you can see a huge difference with like you can see the weight change in their face yeah it communicates the time jump really well yeah, yeah. You really feel you really feel like fifteen years has passed, and that they're entirely different people. Even even putting aside the physical performance, just especially how Choi Min Shik acts and how he carries himself, and his facial expressions, and his mannerisms, and his body language, like it's a really incredible performance. The really great performances all around. Like I, I it's it's awe inspiring. It's it's very next yeah, level completely unreserved yeah. yeah yeah and even with the um the villain character you saying it's you know a little bit over the top uh i think it i think it works i think it works with yes what this character like does the lengths he goes to i do buy that he is this kind of like he's kind of big in business he's got this penthouse he's clearly 
quite obsessive. But yeah, it's all expressed through this character really well. And the the goofiness never holds it back in my mind. That's part Not of the character all. to me. Because it is such a, like, it, he, <laughs> you can kind of excuse a lot of things when the framing is, it's someone who's been locked in an environment for 15 years with only TV to watch. <laughs> I and feel dumplings. like there's a bunch of stuff that, <laughs> and dumplings, yeah. Because that's like a, that's like a, a little bit of a, a hack they have, like in the writing sometimes where kind of explains how he's so good at fighting, <laughs> um, mm. explains how he knows this and that because of, yeah, just obsessively watching the TV. And they address things like, oh, why didn't he just try and end his own life when he was stuck in this situation? They show it. They show the results of it. Yeah. They even address the believability of uh, hypnotism. And they say that, you know, Wu Jin says, oh, you two were actually particularly receptive <laughs> to hypnotism. Yeah. Uh, they address yeah. him not going completely crazy they say that they gave him like antipsychotic or anti schizophrenic drugs during his 15 years so that he didn't completely lose his mind just so the rest of the plot could happen yeah. and so yeah there is there is a level of you know when you're dealing with things like hypnotism and all these things that just like happen to work out it seems very self-aware and i like that it addresses that and it doesn't feel like the script is cheating us. It doesn't feel like the story is like, oh, come on, you know, of course, yo, that just happens to happen. It, it never feels cheap and it never feels unwarranted and it never feels like the script is not aware of it in any sense. Yeah, yeah, because anything especially involving memory and memory loss and hypnotism and amnesia and this kind of stuff, it can be like, it can be quite annoying. You know, to just like use it as an excuse to reset a character just so we can go along with their ride. But yeah. you're right, they do they do structure it into the plot enough. They do acknowledge it when you do have the kind of technical questions you might imagine, like how's this work? Like, yeah. These these meat cutes that happen, like it explains like, oh okay. Like you have thought about this the way it like concludes bringing the hypnotist back at the end, mm -hmm. setting all that up, giving it a payoff. Yeah, yeah, it does really work. It, that doesn't distract me. And that entire sequence of like him and his mirror self and like one of you knows the secret and that character is going to walk away and die. Like, I love that visual representation. I, I love that it really it, there's thought put into the psychology of hypnotism and selective memory. And it's it's not just, oh, this happens and we're going to insist it happens. Like they, they show you how it could happen through the perspective of that character. Also, the the main character being convinced that Wu Jin altered his memory and being like, "How? Why would you make me forget this?" And Wu Jin's like, "You simply just forgot." And then we see how it happened, and you you could understand how that could happen, how he could forget that, because yeah. from his perspective, all he did was just you know tell one random person on one day. Yeah, it wasn't a big deal to him. Yeah, that's a great line. That's yeah. a great reveal. Very believable. Yeah, his his yeah entire life being destroyed and and. Uh, Wu Jin's suffering was not ever really noticed by Odessu, mm -hmm. which, yeah, it's a, it's a great sort of, it's a great thing to think about in the context of the film. And it makes sense for the context of yeah, the film. Yeah, and it fleshes out that character. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, otherwise strange, he would know <laughs> if he did some terrible thing and he remembered it, you know, like if he was, was so malicious yeah, yeah. about something that, of course, he would just know right away who, who did it. But he'd didn't even get the name he had written down every person that he might have slighted or might have done something wrong to and he came up with a sizable list too and i i love yeah that's th another great scene that yeah, uh, it's a long list and it's none of them yeah he's not he's not treated as like a perfect character that is just a great guy that all these bad things are happening to like he he knows in the line in the film that's reincorporated is even though i'm no better than a beast don't i have the right to live it mm. it fits it fits and it works and it, it's just it's yeah meaningful and it, it, thought provoking oh and the, yeah the way he's like a mess in that opening where he's like a he's clearly a drunk love it he's missing his daughter's birthday love the performance there too yeah that is a very good drunk acting yeah you never see great drunk acting it's very difficult to do as an actor those bird wings those angel wings you get that prop in there too and when that comes back later in the reveal twist moment where she's mm -hmm. got the wings on, like innocently flapping them in that room. It's like such a, such a powerful, like gross image. <laughs> um, yeah, and that, that that's that's part of what makes great reincorporation is is something like that appearing at the beginning of the film, 
and you don't expect it to be reincorporated because yeah. it serves a different mm-hmm. purpose. It serves the comedic tone of that drunken scene of, you know, it explains that he's going to meet his daughter for birthday or whatever, got a present. But you don't expect it to necessarily be reincorporated because, we, you know, maybe a different movie might show like, ah, uh, he dropped the wings and then you see them disappear after an umbrella goes yeah. over. Like, or it doesn't do it anything. Yeah. Yeah, it's it knows that it's memorable because it's creating something memorable by existing in the context of the film, and it doesn't have to explicitly point it out, and it doesn't have to shove our face in it. It just happens naturally, and that way it can be reincorporated without it feeling cheap or stupid. It's something that anybody watching the movie is going to remember. I, you know, that that's not something I was confused about on my first watch or anything. No, no. And despite how much is happening in this under two hour film despite how many things are happening and it is we could call it complex it's not hard to follow it's a it's a very digestible story and the the confidence at which this film is directed and presented and the, the the way the story is told it knows what it is and it knows that it's creating something that an audience can follow and it, it it's the 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 true skill of being able to present something with that confidence. It's just, uh, yeah. Chan Wook Park is one of my favorite directors. Um, he's my favorite Korean director for sure. He might be, you know, my top 10, top 20. I don't know, but I'd have to give some Mm. serious thought about that. He's, he's really, really incredible at what he does. Yeah. makes it seem like effortless. Yeah. Um, going back to the, hypnotism type angle i want to know your interpretation of that kind of ambiguous ending so obviously there's that whole scene where they bring the hypnotist back uh he has to write it all out because he doesn't have a tongue anymore (laughs) Uh, instructions of what he wants and what he has to do and it it kind of boils to a moment where they're reunited father and daughter and you don't know as an audience member if it worked, what he remembers, what he doesn't exactly. particularly remember, and he pulls he pulls this facial expression. It's like such a perfect thing to end on, such a perfect symbol of like it look it looks pained but simultaneously happy happy. Yeah. It could be any of these extreme emotions, and you're just like, Oh my god. He's he's <laughs> broken but relieved that he knows that it's over in some sense. There's there's yeah. it's a it, he he understands that there's a resolution to you know not just the story but the past fucking 15 years of his life like the the context of it being over that amount of time and it being believable that it's over that amount of time like Mm -hmm. that fucking uh, sense of relief that the character must feel but yeah again we don't we don't know if he if the hypnotism worked we don't know if he actually uh remembers any of that or what he remembers or yeah because you you could easily interpret that as like it's the character just fully snapping losing it like (laughs) the maybe wasn't even a hypnotist there at all like you see the two chairs but like he's just standing there in the in the frozen wilderness like it's uh it could be anything it's like i guess it's highlighting that point it it almost doesn't matter like the (laughs) At that point, the situation that he's gone through, it's like such a dark ending point. It's bittersweet. It's like, it is bittersweet because even 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 the best result is what he forgets, but he's still kind of in this bizarre relationship with his daughter and she just doesn't know. It's almost like a <laughs> a more disturbing Last of Us type thing. Yeah, it's, it's fucked up no matter what the outcome is. It's pretty fucked up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but- like the deal is done. I guess that's the whole... The vengeance thing, like, is is normally the the full stop point. The the story is trying to tell is the, like how frivolous and pointless and <laughs> just <laughs> there's no no good place to take this kind of <laughs> obsession fueled by this one emotion or or anger. Yeah, I didn't rewatch the remake, but I just remembered how they ended it. Uh, Josh Brolin decides to go back <laughs> in in. T- <laughs> to the to, to the the prison, and he's like, "I'm noble. I'm gonna oh, suffer for everything." Because I have seen it. I did he see it when it came out. It was obviously ten years ago now. Um, the only thing I remember is the 
the octopus scene, the famous octopus scene being like referenced in the most like, wow, that's like a really lazy way of doing it. That's like one of the most famous scenes from this movie. And you're really just going to nod that way. Like, I remember that in my mind being like, what a strange, just, just what is, what a strange project that is. Just, uh, <laughs> like, a, yeah, Spike Baffling. Lee, old boy remake. Just like, okay. It's a reinterpretation. Uh, and, the, <laughs> and it doesn't commit to any of the major beats from memory. Like, do they, st- do they still do the incest thing in the same way? I, I feel like it's toned down entirely compared to like how extreme the original is. Yeah, I think it's the same reveal for Josh Brolin's character, I think. I don't remember. It's still like the incest thing. Yeah. It's, isn't it, it's like Elizabeth Olsen or something. I have, uh, if anybody's curious, I have a very long but very good yeah. review. That's the last time I would have seen anything to do with the it. The old boy remake compare what works about the original and how badly the remake fails i would (laughs) say that's one of my best videos i think most people that watch my channel would say that as well Mm. unfortunately it's demonetized because the subject matter of of the film is you know you can't i I don't know i could possibly censor that out like the whole it's what the film's about right so apparently not suitable for advertisers so that sucks but you know damn Spend a lot of time working on yeah. it, uh, but it's a it's a good video if anybody yeah, wants to video. watch that instead of the remake just to see what was in the remake. I, I would recommend that. Yeah, I uh, it's a big big piece of poo. I <laughs> would like to point out the music in this film, mm. both what is scored for the film and also the occurrences of classical music. Mm. Every instance of music in this film is fucking perfect as soon as the movie starts i get so hyped yeah and i I have the song in my head right now i have the shot in my head right now everything the emotions like i can grab the tie like it's 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 so it it, it, everything about this film is just so powerful that it imprints on you and it leaves you having felt something genuine yeah it's right the the way it's wrapped up in the editing too is excellent i thought as well yes the, like diegetic ways some like a song might be playing and then a phone will slam and that will just completely change the scene or the feel yeah there's yeah loads of and that recurring like that. theme the boom, 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 mm-hmm. boom, boom. and that was the same song that played on the alarm clock before he you know mm. sleeping gas played and so it's in the character's memory and then we get that incorporated in the actual soundtrack non-diegetically through an orchestra some string instruments and then we have Wu Jin <laughs> humming it later yes and it's just it, these for for a film that incorporates something like hypnotism and memory it's kind of doing that to the audience as well it's planting these little seeds throughout the experience so that when they're reincorporated in different ways it does feel emotionally significant and it does feel kind of scary and it and and you do remember these things and there's a part of your brain going like have i heard this before and then it's the same song but it's a different rendition when it's the ringtone and he when he gets the call on the cell phone when he's Mm. at the restaurant yeah and that like all of these little tiny bits of reincorporation that just are sprinkled throughout the film but done so in in not the same way over and over but in different ways, but familiar enough to to just get that subconscious emotional response out of you. It's it's really really perfect. I love it. Yeah. And also, they reincorporated the um, the, the classical piece, which I forget the name of. That was playing when he was torturing the guy whose teeth he removes. Oh yeah, and whose the guy ran the, off the prison. Yeah. Yeah. So that's. That's playing when he's torturing him. Exact same song plays again when they show up at the home and Mito's tied up and they're about to inflict that same damage on him. Mm. And so that, you know, there's there's little microcosms of of revenge within this greater revenge story and the the music tying things together not only in, in a effective way to feel something and get excited and and the juxtaposition of of this 
music that could be played over like a fuck it could be played in in like the the, the favorite or mm-hmm. some period yeah, piece. Yeah. The juxtaposition of that where you, you could you could match that to a number of different scenes tones but that excitement and that 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 uh just emotional resonance in this classical music you feel different emotions at the same time you you feel, you're watching him removing the guy's teeth it simultaneously feels like fucked up and horrifying but also exciting mm-hmm. and also fun and and that's what the character's feeling he's yeah. it, he's getting these little bits of revenge that he's wanted for 15 years the cas- catharsis that he's experiencing and then same music reincorporated when the implication is that the guy is going to get revenge back on him he's going to make him feel the exact same thing he's not even he's he's doing the exact same thing he gets like a, a hammer the other end of a hammer and he's about to remove his teeth he wants him to feel exactly what he felt he wants him to to have experienced the same pain and so the same music appearing at the same time we feel those same emotions in a way and it's kind of scary and brought in a different context of the character that you're relating to now being at the other end of that and you know when you think about what Wu Jin has done he didn't just get revenge on Odessu he wanted him to feel a similar feeling to what mm-hmm. he felt. You know, he he uh, tricked him into having an incestuous relationship of his own and wanted him to feel the complexities and the 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 moral struggles that would come with being in love with somebody that you're uh, related to mm-hmm. <laughs> and taking that away from them and and the the parallels of what each character is trying to make each other character experience in the film it's just yeah love it yeah yeah i love the way they echo each other and the way the they're so like intrinsically linked after this point they're so like messed up together but that level of detail it isn't just with the music it goes into every technical aspect you know like just the the basic audio design, certain choices there are awesome. I love that scene with the gas masks, yeah. where it's just them breathe things slow down for a second. It's mm, like quite creepy. melancholy, very creepy. You just hear that breathing. Yeah. Well, the color purple. Yeah, lots of great usages of color. Being reincorporated. Um, yeah. Visually too, like uh, uh, we haven't even mentioned the the kind of action slant the film has. I mentioned the. Mm-hmm. The lead knows how to fight because of all the he's been like training against a wall um, for years and years, and he puts it to the test a couple times. There are a couple really excellent like fist fight action scenes with, of course, the the most famous. It's probably the most famous shot from this movie: the the one in the hallway, the hammer fight. Uh, yes, excellent stuff. It's 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 a type of choreography that's really tough to get right, where it is obviously all like took like 15 attempts and everyone is like has to hit these certain markers and it's such a long scene mm-hmm. so everyone has so much responsibility and you have to make it look natural and it has to flow a certain way and man i feel like they do such a great job it's it they really sell yeah. it and the and with it being the only scene that's shot that way it makes it it does make it pop and like sit in the film in such a like mm-hmm. satisfying way well w- when most people write something like okay point a one character has to fight a dozen characters and then mm-hmm. point B, he wins, escapes, gets out of there. Most people would write that in a way where, oh, the character just, you know, might almost get hit a couple times, but he's like just so good at it. He's like, this isn't a superhero. By the end of the scene, he's f- bleeding to death. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. He's got a knife in it. He pulls a knife out of his back and, you know, it, it's it's highlighted just how weak and uh, physically broken he is by the end of that scene by the fact that Wu Jin literally just shows up, puts him in a cab, reveals himself and says like, farewell, Odessu. Mm -hmm. And you can see him like he's trying to escape out of his body. You see you, you see him sit up and react, but he can't move because he's like about to fucking yeah, die yeah. he needs medical <laughs> attention right he can't just can't get up and start happening. chasing him like and you know that based on everything else that the film is showing and based on what we get out of the character and, and just how clear 
and extreme his motivations for revenge and discovering the truth are, we know that he would want nothing more than to go and chase him. So what we're left with is, oh, there's a actual physical reason that that's stopping him. Like he's actually that broken. He's ab- actually that damaged after the fight that he can't. And not only not only the outcome of the fight scene and how he's bleeding by the end of it, but the the way that the fight is shown, you have moments that in any other film, if that happened on set, they would say that's sloppy, do it again. But the sloppiness of the fighting adds to the film's authenticity. Completely. The fact that sometimes they miss each other. Sometimes they just fall over on a trip over or something. Real fights are messy and and yeah, they miss punches. They're throwing things and it's just going random. Yeah, e- yeah. Like, even fucking like UFC fights, you know, mm-hmm. professional fighters. Like it's it's messy. It's not this. You know, you see every other action movie or especially American action movies. It's not this. You know, song and dance choreography necessarily. And in this film, you could argue that it is, but it's just done so in a much more realistic way, where the imperfections add to the experience they add to how real and how brutal and legitimate this the the fight scene feels Mm -hmm. that it is one guy against 12 guys and he shouldn't make it through and he makes it through with determination and you know also his practice fighting against a wall or whatever we want to call it he makes it through but just barely just barely he makes it through and you get that um nice moment of humor when uh, he's gotten through yeah, those the elevator. 12 guys and then, yeah, wave two comes. You, know, you just see the aftermath of it. Yeah, Love it. Funny stuff. Yeah, there's great moments of humor within this really fucked up and really serious film. One of the things I love the most about Korean cinema is that there's always this really delicate balance, this this perfect dance that they're doing with emotions that, a lot of other filmmakers would be too afraid to include in their film simultaneously. Mm-hmm. So Bong Joon-ho is really great at this as, yeah. as well. Uh, something like Parasite. It, the humor doesn't detract from the seriousness of the film. Yeah, you can have right. silly characters, the host even, you know, you can have silly, dumb, comedic moments that don't make the more serious moments feel less legitimate. And yeah, I, I feel like this movie does it perfectly. Yeah. Another thing I was quite into was uh, a lot of shots start with something mid-motion, just implying and like filling you in visually in such a like interesting, clever way. Like there's a scene where they're eating the uh, mm-hmm. uh, blanket on the wood. Dumplings? Yeah, the dumplings. Um and the shot opens Dumps. with <laughs> the daughter character. She's like leaning over the table. It's like a really dynamic pose mm-hmm. she's in with the chopstick yeah. in hand. Um, and it there or when that character gets shot at the end and then it cuts to the blood like in his eye and he's like wiping out of his eye. Or, um, or of course, the one at the beginning, the uh, yeah. opening on the guy dangling off the rooftop by the the tie, all these like really dynamic poses that do keep coming back and uh, referenced again. And it's just very clever. Like everything's just been thought through such a like fine comb, like everything vigorously. Yeah. Yeah. When you have someone as, as talented as Park Chan-wook and as methodical and who cares enough about what they're expressing and how they're expressing it. And it needs to be right. And it needs to be a certain way. And the vision works. Yeah, it's, it's not the weekend. <laughs> you know, it's, there's an actual vision here, and there's something he wants to express, and something he wants to express in a particular way. There's interviews. Of, there's an entire like making of documentary where I, I don't know. I, I guess it's in this. Yeah, uh, where he talks about like the choices for like mm. color palettes in the film, and like that the heavy greens that we see, and just he talks about having experimented with like a bunch of different cameras and just picking the right one and the right lens and you know to just to be able to get the look of the film that he wanted before mm. starting to film it there there was a very clear vision and it seems that it just it, it, this is exactly what he wanted it to be how do you feel about the uh cg bugs the ants under the skin cg bugs yeah i think it's cool yeah 
you know, there's maybe there's a couple elements of the film where it's like, okay, it's a little dated with the CG or whatever, but it doesn't, you know, it's it's done well enough that it doesn't make it it doesn't make me go, oh, I'm watching a movie and I can't think about what the characters are doing because everything mm-hmm. else is just so powerful yeah. that moments like that just don't bother me. And I love that those were included, the the ants, because it, it does bring this kind of non-literal psychological aspect to the film about you know yeah. saying like when people are lonely they hallucinate ants uh which i don't know if that's true or not but i'm just willing to believe it for the context of the film either way yeah it makes a good visual too yeah yeah and it also uh you know it, it gives us a little bit of context into mito's world it shows that she's lonely as well we get that shot of her hallucinating ants in a very different way than Odessu was, but it's it you know we get context to the character. It's it's crazy how morally fucked up <laughs> and <laughs> not just v- f- imperfect is not even selling it. The, the the character of Odessu, right? Like he he gets rapey, he gets rapey. Oh yeah, big time. And it's not to excuse that, and not to say that that's cool or anything but the character after 15 years of blue balls <laughs> mm-hmm. you know he the, it the film justifies you know not the character doing it but why the character would do it that's one of the best jokes actually is when he's in the elevator going down and in his <laughs> head or the narration or something like yeah there's a woman yeah here <laughs> yeah he's just like pushed up against the walls and then afterwards the implication is that he like groped her or something she's like yelling at the Security officer mm, who's just like, oh, he's leaving. <laughs> he's like trying not to, <laughs> to get involved. Yeah. yeah, it's really fucked up. And like, he's not a moral character. He's not like a good character, but you, you're you there with him for his struggle and you're there with him for his journey. And you tr- still have, there's there's enough happening in the film and how it's presented that you still have a lot to think about for yourself like what would you do if you were in prison for 15 years right like i wouldn't rape anybody but mm-hmm. <laughs> you know you're you're still the emotions are so powerful and the concepts are so powerful that yeah. it's still it's not unrelatable it's not unrelatable like everything yeah. in the idol it's entirely relatable yeah. it's exploring depravity in a way yeah yeah it's what annoys me so much about like you hear these stories about like the, what the rock forces to be in his contracts. You know, his character can't be too much of a baddie or have enough complexity to him. Where it's like, no. this is what you want to see. You want to see these these fuck ups, these flawed people that yes. are put through some kind of through something interesting. Like you know, like explore the depravity, explore this this fucked up stuff. Like yeah, yeah that that's takes everything talent. You want to see it takes talent, <laughs> yeah. both in the writing and the acting. Damn straight to like explore. A character that you are not to explore some somebody who is like truly fucked up. <laughs> Can you imagine the rock like on all fours, like licking oh, yeah. someone's shoe? <laughs> I mean, the Josh Brolin <laughs> bit was already embarrassing enough. Like him trying to do that freak out scene <laughs> of like, oh yeah. no, no, uh. it's like fucking god, Jesus Christ! Like, what do you think? <sighs> yeah, it's so embarrassing because this is what 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 pisses <laughs> me off about that remake. Is that this is maybe the most accessible foreign language film that you could show to someone who yeah. likes American films. Like this yeah. is this is one of the most easily likable things. Like you could take someone that thinks that they just don't want to watch a movie with subtitles or thinks that they don't like foreign movies, and this would be the one that changes their mind. So the, to act yeah. like we needed a fucking American remake for that <laughs> is just like <laughs> like okay, really? What did you really want to communicate, Spike? Like what? Come on. Yeah, and then they do a bad job localizing it. The whole thing is that that's what's craziest to me. Everything's already there. The whole story's there. This the whole thing is storyboard. It's perfect. Like, it's already there. <laughs> oh yeah, and then for his reinterpretation or whatever we want to call it, you know, even if you were trying to make a different point, you missed the point. You know, like it. it it's <laughs> I don't. It's always embarrassing comparing bad remakes to the original because I have to wonder what was the movie to you. Was it this surface? Yeah. Le- what was was the entire experience of watching the film to you this surface level that your reimagining or reinterpretation or you know y- your version of it just 
why why would you create something where you don't feel the 15 years time difference? Why would you create something where it doesn't matter that it was dumplings and he just didn't like it and he had fucking frost and flakes and rice and all this other shit and whatever? Like, mm-hmm. why would you why would you take something that matters and then turn it into something that doesn't matter? Josh Brolin, you, there's a scene of him like jerking off into a pillow. And it's just there for no particular reason. It doesn't show his desperation. It doesn't show it it, it 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 doesn't show that he's subjected to doing this and he's embarrassed and he's at his lowest and he's just so desperate for human connection that he's been that, that he's now resorted to doing that. He's just doing it. So what what did you get out of the movie when you're missing you're you're clearly recreating parts of scenes but you're not recreating everything that would make that scene matter. You're showing us yeah. a version of the original, but everything that made what you saw in the original important and significant and emotionally resonant is not included in the film. So what did you watch? What the fuck did you think you watched? Right? Yeah. Time and time again. All of the classic details that made old boy what it is to begin with are like almost purposefully taken out and it's like completely neutered. <laughs> so it's like, why'd you even do it then? If, you, if yeah. you knew you couldn't embody any of what the original story was and the edgy stuff and the violence and the commentary and everything that's there, if you didn't think you could do it. Why are you even bothering? Because you're just going to embarrass yourselves and that's what happened. Yeah. Probably a bunch of money was lost too because they're never cheap. They're like new <laughs> productions. <laughs> yeah. That's what's good because it's not like a funny games thing, you know? No. You could have funny games, did probably. No. I mean, that was the director making his own movie again in the way that he wanted to from the beginning and now with the, you know, ability to. Yeah. Very different. <laughs> Very different. I'm just skimming through my old boy review because there's, I'm trying to remember exactly what happened in the, uh, they replaced tooth pulling with something dumb, and I'm trying to remember what it was. Oh, yeah, there's no chance I remember. Oh yeah, <laughs> he's just he, the, the Sam Jackson's playing the guy, and Josh Brolin is just cutting like little tiny bits of skin off of his neck, like little chunks. Oh, like, what? And then pouring salt on it, and something that my roommate Gael pointed out that I included in my review is just that the difference between those torture methods has a uh, there, there's a psychological aspect to us watching the tooth pulling scene that we might not even be mm. conscious about is that it's a relatable pain we've all been to the dentist we we know how fucking yeah. painful that is with <laughs> like novocaine mm-hmm. we 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 all have that level of relatability nobody nobody's getting like little bits of their neck little chunks of skin taken out and then salt no. like well it's thematic as well to a certain degree because like the whole reason he's in this mess is because of his mouth his big exactly mouth, you know exactly very thematic yeah that is that is completely missing the point <laughs> yeah it's incredible I don't even remember that I just yeah there's so much about the remake that's just forgettable very embarrassing <laughs> and uh Father. Well, supposedly, um, I, I read. Uh, oh yeah, the flashback. Father. Uh, Spielberg was supposed to. He was like originally attached. He, it was like his passion project for a bit, and he like dropped it in two thousand nine or something, and it became a Lee joint. Yeah, a joint. Although this, I think, is the only film where it doesn't say joint at the beginning, because there was a. Uh, he made a. Well, he already made like a bloated version, um, but it was supposed to be like way longer and they trimmed it down oh, okay. uh so it seems like by the end of it he wasn't exactly happy with what he made either <laughs> really weird in his filmography it's really not a director i would have pinned doesn't make any sense you know it's like a best case scenario for an old boy remake it's like a it's a particularly odd one to be honest <laughs> very doesn't make any sense no nah. yeah what more can we say this is like a really one of the best movies ever yeah, the the titles at the beginning, the the way that the letters tick like a clock and time, and mm. just very, very purposeful. Every piece of the puzzle fits, and it's uh, yeah, one of the best one of the best movies ever. Best introduction to South Korean cinema you could possibly have. I guess you know some people like uh, Parasite more, but yeah, 
I think this is uh, incredible. It's pre- yeah, it's pretty close in my mind. Yeah, very different movies. They're not, you know, the only reason yeah. to compare them is because they're Korean movies. But yeah, probably two of the most famous. Yeah, ten out of ten. Yeah, I think I'm there with you. I think this this is a ten out of ten. Um, any single slight thing I have against it are such nitpicks that, in the grand scheme, they are. It is just like a CG ant. That's like it, pretty much. There's, yeah, there's really nothing <laughs> I, I would point to. Yeah, nothing that really matters too much Mm -hmm. uh the benefits outweigh the flaws to such an extreme degree that yeah exactly the the flaws just basically don't even exist anymore yeah yeah loads of great lines loads of memorable scenes just so much imagery the like the the rooftop uh uh, escape thing with the the briefcase just that imagery the green and the red against each other Man, there's just so much good stuff here. It's uh, yeah, quite a meal, quite an octopus-heavy meal. Yeah. Oh yeah. Do we want to talk about the ethical? I mean, I guess we've had this conversation before, but eats a fucking octopus. Yeah, because I know the the actor um, he's, he's Buddhist or something, so he had to pray after filming that scene. Um, and I think it took them two or three <laughs> octopi. Mm-hmm. Um. It's hard to be consistent with this because, like, what if you if you eat fish and you eat meat, uh, can you really get upset by it being used in art? In- no, no, it's it's contradictory. You know what I've thought about uh, recently is like we we're, we're so detached from the process of our food, meat. Yeah. You know, like we there's a, there's when if you eat meat, you're paying someone to rape and torture and kill an animal right Mm -hmm. and people will often say like no but it's it's if you eat it it's fine because it's because you're using it it's like okay that's that's fine but nobody looks at the channel how to basic and thinks oh you just paid people to torture rape and kill an animal and didn't eat it nobody looks like there's this weird disconnect where if you see it taking place on screen like an old boy then suddenly there's like a moral issue with it that you know, just look at any how-to basic video. Nobody's nobody's <laughs> fucking saying, "Hey, you didn't yeah. eat the meat." There's so, like you can you can buy a hamburger and throw it on the ground. You paid for someone to torture, rape, and kill a cow, and then you didn't eat it. You're not going to jail. No one thinks you should go to jail for wasting meat. Like you, it, it, so really the you know, even though people say that you know if you eat it it's morally okay i think i think the real issue is just whether or not people see it i think that's the deciding factor is that people just choose to be ignorant over these things yeah yeah i feel like i felt i feel differently uh depending on the project at hand um because i remember like cannibal holocaust there's a couple scenes where like a turtle gets dismembered or something it just feels like you're just doing this just to be shocking, just to be, mm-hmm. just for it to fit in with the, the film. I wasn't too much into that, but then there's what like Apocalypse Now, where I'm pretty sure you see the bull or a cow kind of get taken out on screen. It's yeah, like, <laughs> if it's a good movie, <laughs> if, if the art is significant. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, I'm pretty sure, and I'm pretty sure like they did use that cow as well, like the the people in that scene. So like, if you want to yeah. get like that. And argument. you know, um, there's there's uh, earlier Hanukkah films, Michelle Hanukkah, Michael Haneke, where mm-hmm. uh, you know, he'll their the character will cut a chicken's head off. That's what they do at the farm. Mm-hmm. It's not like you don't know if they ate it after, and even if they didn't, like what? So you you know, is how to basic? Is he a monster? I don't know. You know, there they a lot of sometimes it's filmed within very specific farming environment like in benny's video they take like a nail gun to a pig's head you don't do was mm-hmm. the pig gonna get that same treatment anyway did they eat the pig after i don't know it's just it seems like people are upset because they see it not because it's happening yeah because that that's that happens in the how-to basic video if he uses pork that's the exact same thing's happening <laughs> yeah we talked about uh that film that crazy film raw right Looks yeah it's like uh it's like a really unethical situation. Um, all these like big cats in like this tiny area, and it's clearly like out of control and not safe. And but what has come out of it? What what has been made? There is this artistic piece in there of value that has that is a result of it. It's not to condone it 
or say that that was a good thing that it happened, but it's like an interesting piece of expression slash art that came as a result of it. Um, so I'm, I'm at least glad we have something, something we can point yeah. out. Yeah, it's not yeah. morally black and white. You can make arguments in any direction. It's not... People, I think a lot of people are comfortable having easy answers to complicated moral questions that really just don't have one. Yeah. It's def yeah, it's definitely been it's definitely been worse as well in the past like <laughs> animal welfare has been typically pretty bad as far as entertainment is yeah. concerned. Yeah. If you I see guess. a horse in a movie, it's like, <laughs> okay, they tortured it. <laughs> yeah, like chimps back in the day, like yeah, all sorts of animals have been used and abused by cinema, but yeah, it's hard just not to go down these these lanes of consistency where I say, well, yeah, personally I do eat meat and it's abstracted in such a way where I'm not thinking about it in that same way. So mm -hmm. maybe it's just being confronted with it just makes people uncomfortable and yeah. people don't like being uncomfortable. People yeah. don't like being reminded of it. No. All right, question time. Cool, let's do some questions from the Sardonicast community. Head over to the suggestion thread on the subreddit where I'll leave a little, well, I already said thread, but a thread for you to leave questions for us in the future, just like bbd4116 did who says when was the last time you went to the movies and had the entire theater to yourself what movie did you see and how was the experience last time for me was when i saw cruella two years ago nice I'm sorry to hear that <laughs> hmm entire theater myself i mentioned it earlier but uh when i saw morbius Nice. Um, empty. <laughs> that was pretty good. That was pretty good. That was one where I didn't feel, uh, I, I felt no guilt like whipping out my phone to note things down nice. and whatnot. You know, that's, that's, that's a nice, nice experience. Nice. Hmm. I've had some like nearly empty shows. I don't know if I can remember the last one that I was entirely by myself. It must have been. Damn, I think it was something I saw in Atlanta. So something in the past like couple years probably, but I just don't I don't remember. Do you schedule when you when you're going to see a movie kind of at the time of day based around a hey, what it is and what kind of genre it is? Cuz like I I'll try and do that depending on that's why I like the Morbius, well, maybe not the best example, but I'll do that for a lot of that that kind of movie. There's kind of genre movies where now, I don't. I don't want to be around certain crowds, you know, certain stinkers. Yeah. Um, so, like, try and go at like a really awkward time in the day, so it's specifically empty. Um, yeah. Whereas, like, if it's a horror movie, I'll tend to try and see it with a bit bigger of a crowd because. Oh yeah. Just bring the different movies. Bring out different types of people. Yeah. I'm like the I, I'm the I opposite saw, when talk it's to me. horror movies. I don't want to see it with other people. People people in horror movies, the crowds, depending on where you are, uh, they can really make a frustrating yeah it depends experience. on the type of harm yeah because i had i did have a hereditary kind of ruined for i was me, thinking of that, that one too thing people in oh, the really? audience just yeah. like some fucking dude is trying to impress the girl next to him and being like i'm not scared and then just making like jokes the entire movie like like tongue click like oh fuck off like right yeah you're such a big boy wow you're such a big <laughs> boy for telling everyone in the theater that you're not scared but the right one when you get the right one like when i saw uh Talk to me, or um, that French movie about the raw. That was a really good one to see with like a, an invigorated crowd. Raw. Um, so it, yeah. Okay. Um, you know what's funny? Earlier, when mm -hmm. you mentioned roar, for a split second, I thought you said raw, and now that you say raw, uh, I'm realizing that would be, there was no be difference between accent. how you said it. So can you say? <laughs> Say Lore. roar and no, yeah. Say them how you were saying them earlier, and I'll try to guess which one's which. Okay, I'll have one in my mind. Um, I'm thinking of the movie Raw right now. <laughs> now say the other one. Uh, the other movie would be the movie Raw. <laughs> <laughs> Damn! I almost thought I had it until you said the other one. <laughs> well, what what's the first one? I think the first one was Roar. Which is which is which one? The lion one? Yeah, well, the way I said it, <laughs> the, there's yeah. a difference. No, yeah, that, you did get it right. You okay, did get good. it right. Yeah. <laughs> roar. Ah! Roar and r r Roar. Say that again. <laughs> roar and Roar. <laughs> no, the way you said it before. The very American accent. Roar. Oh, my God. 
<laughs> it's so it's just it's very unnerving <laughs> to to hear that. <laughs> just the the accent. <laughs> Do an American accent. The rest of the podcast. Roar. Ugh. I looked in the mirror. Ugh. <laughs> All right. We don't like it. Uh, what were we? What was the question? <laughs> you were talking about. Okay, yeah, you were talking about seeing Raw in a theater. That's right. The yeah, French the, film. Yeah, yeah. The French film. Yeah. That that was yeah that was a good experience with a horror movie, but yeah, yeah whatever we're talking about. Any uh any other empty moments you can think of? Or? I mean, I've had like nearly empty screenings for a lot of movies I watch. I uh, when I was in Montreal, I caught a screening for Kokomo City, which I had already seen at Sundance earlier in the mm. year, but I wanted to see it again because it was awesome. And I also was curious if the f- festival cut versus the theater cut would have a little bit better audio mixing i think it did yeah yeah that was, i i really like that movie it was a really good documentary yeah so that had two other people in the audience maybe but mm. you know it's a fucking indie theater playing a movie that you know you have to be aware of before you see it and you know. that's the thing yeah you have to have expectations based on what the movie is where you're seeing it what the time of day is i the the i will try to catch the earliest showings possible in general, but depending on which day of the week I'm free or a friend's free, you know, do I have a, am I scheduled to be at the gym with my trainer earlier in the day? Maybe I have to do like a 3 p.m., 4 p.m. show or something. I try not to do the late night weekend ones unless I have to. There's certain things that I might want to see like in a big crowd, I guess, but yeah, for, for horror movies, I try to avoid late night weekends and i also especially those showings if you're in a theater that's attached to a mall i find like those are consistently the Mm. worst crowds because it's a lot of teenagers that are not at the movie because they wanted to see the movie they're at the movie because they're trying to kill time and they were just at the mall anyway and they looked at the whatever and they're like oh horror movie i'm gonna press my girlfriend yeah i get that so yeah i try to avoid those Although it, uh, I saw, uh, what was it called, Smile um, <laughs> in a pretty packed theater. <laughs> one of those like nice ones where you sit on a sofa or whatever. Nice. Um, but that 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 was probably made better by the audience because people were like engaging, and I, and I, it's that, it's that kind of level. It's on that quality level where I feel like, man, even if someone says something annoying. I'm not like missing out, whereas like in Hereditary, so like, I actually want to hear what's going on. I want to, see, <laughs> I don't want this to be ruined right now. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it does depend I think on what you're seeing. I'm trying to, yeah, in a in a horror movie that's not good anyway, and you're just there to like riff on in your own head, then yeah, it doesn't matter. I think Paranormal Activity too is something <laughs> yeah. where people were just like yelling at it. And just, <laughs> the, I remember a point where someone like exited the movie, like in the middle of the movie, just like a fuck it, I'm done. And they, it, the way that they walked out of the theater was like the most attention grabbing thing, but it was very funny. And people were like <laughs> genuinely like laughing, like it was an entire crowd of people laughing at the movie. And that was funny. Yeah, that's, that works. Yeah. It's not annoying. <laughs> okay. Schleaky Deaky says this. Have you guys been gaming on anything recently? I got a Steam Deck earlier this year, and I feel like it's reverted me to my child brain with my Game Boy Advance. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did pick up a Steam Deck in the end. Ooh. Um, been toying around with it. Uh, played Disco Elysium. You played that one? Not yet. Um, I've heard good on, things. It's though. on my backlog for so long. Yeah. Crazy writing. Super, super okay. creative. Um, yeah, I was very impressed. Um by the back, the backbone on that one. And I've just been playing Dark Souls three on the Steam Deck as well. Uh, How's it running? Just, just actually pretty good. Like, um, it's, de- it's definitely completely playable for me. Uh, I'm normally good. kind of a frame rate snob, but like on that on that screen on the portable uh, platform, like it just doesn't bug me. It's pretty consistent. Uh, it just it just murders battery, I think, um, mm-hmm. compared to running yeah or whatever. If you're on a plane and there's like an outlet or something, you just leave it plugged in. Yeah. It's not the best yeah. battery life, but you know, we're early adopters to a piece of technology. Yeah, that I will think it's really cool technology better. though. Oh, it's great. 
I, I just love it for emulating and just having like a little portable fucking PS3 <laughs> or yeah, N64. Yeah, I haven't even delved into that yet. Yeah. Yeah, there's some good stuff. It's it, I like having the largest library possible in a portable device that I can just bring on an airplane. You know, like fucking I've, I've always been so pissed at Nintendo because they had the mm-hmm. opportunity with the Switch especially to just release their entire back catalog as emulated or oh, yeah. backwards compatible games. And a lot of them wouldn't be that complicated. They're fucking... Like they did on the Wii. They like literally did that on the Wii. They yeah, like for a lot so of stuff. So much good stuff, yeah. Just, yeah, if you give... Every N64 game should be available on the Switch. And if they're not going to make it available, then they can't complain if somebody emulates it on another mm-hmm. software without paying for it or another hardware. Yeah, it's still like a conversation uh, for whenever the inevitable Switch 2 comes out. Like, are they going to do the typical Nintendo thing of like you have to make a fresh account and you don't like <laughs> you don't get your library? I wonder. So I'm pretty sure like every console they've reset it. <laughs> yeah, it's so I don't lame. Think you've ever like carried over your games? Yeah, just just for the sake of media preservation, right? Video oh, yeah. games are art. Preserve art. There's some things you no, can't you should preserve. Preserve but... their revenue stream. That's what. Oh. That's what's important. They would. They would sell more consoles if they. If they were like, hey, you can play every fucking Super Nintendo game and every single Game Boy game and every single N64 game and blah 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 blah. blah. Right. It's fucking preloaded. They're just such a traditional company, though, man. This. It's yeah. Too much freedom to give the consumer. They can't sell Mario 64 for the hundredth time again. Yeah. Yeah, I've been enjoying Steam Deck. I game on everything else. I got a PC, got a Series X, got a PS5, and I got a Switch. And I think I use my Switch the least, but I'm not like a huge Nintendo fanboy, so. Yeah, I think I'm right there with you. Yeah. Yeah, mostly PC now. Another one. Another one. Let's do this one from Groglek. Another one. Alex, you mentioned in a recent episode that you like to listen to Mark Commode. You're a regular listener of his and Mayo's podcast. What are some of your favorite Commode rants slash reviews? His takes often seem like a complete opposite to the popular opinion of Sardonicus community. For example, he loves Minions, but is very critical towards Kaufman. How do you feel about that? Um, edit fun game. Imagine if you could get Commode to be a guest on the podcast. What he movie would, not. would you discuss? I'm sure I'm <laughs> sure we're below him. I, I wouldn't be surprised if he'd has negative feelings towards internet critics anyway oh definitely uh well if you could have a movie discussion with him what would you pick ah man i reckon you could get something good out of um under the silver light cracks he's he's, he really doesn't like that movie yeah but there's some whatever i so mark kermode is a big name because he does radio stuff and it's very consumable and easy to listen to you know, you could you could watch it on YouTube. And so that helps promote his brand. And it's not like, you know, I, I'm not saying that what he has to say is not substantive or anything, but, you know, that is a big component of it. When I, uh, if I hear that he loves something that I hated or hates something that I loved, sometimes I'll check it out just trying to hope that, ho- hoping that I get some sort of understanding. And then I watch mm-hmm. the whole thing. And I'm like, you didn't really to help me understand why you liked this or you didn't really help me understand why you hated this <laughs> uh, by the yeah. end of it. Oh, that happens way too often. Yeah, I get that. It, it can be a thing about um, like, especially people with the traditional kind of media background um, when it comes to like reviewing stuff it can get. It can get up its own ass to such a degree where like it's all about the like clever zingers and the headlines and the wordplay to like such a point where it's like you're not even discussing the movie yeah you know at a certain level it's like i didn't really know what you're even even trying to say but um i think he's largely very entertaining i do like he's very entertaining his show and i'll kind of do more of what you just said like if i hear that it will have a really strong opinion on something like under the silver lake i'll be very curious to go and listen to that hear him out um and then of course i think i mentioned it on a previous episode i just i like his his, his angry ones, his Pirates of the Caribbean mm-hmm. rants are very funny um, when something gets under his skin. The visit was very funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the M. Night ones are good. Um, yeah. yeah, this kind of feeds into 
I found this. It was a review of Old Boy. Um, I'm just trying to pull it up right now. Where where twenty thirteen? It was a review that had this exact problem. We're talking no, the original. It was, it was a critical response to the original nice. Old Boy from here. It is the New York Times, um, and it's exactly what we're just saying about this is this is like a couple of sentences from it. What they said was the fact that Old Boy is embraced by some cinephiles is symptomatic of a bankrupt, reductive postmodernism, one that promotes a spurious aesthetic relativism and finds it, its crudest expression in the hermetically sealed world of fanboys. Like, what? <laughs> See, something, something that I'm at least proud of with my old boy review is that you can't watch it and not understand why people think it's a great movie. You can't watch my yeah. review of old boy 2003 slash 2013 and not understand why so many people connect with the original film and why so why the remake fails so hard for many people. Yeah. And so it is interesting hearing, you know, there's a, someone who I will not name uh, that uh, just some random irrelevant reviewer that I used to find kind of clownable back in the day, but I've just not paid <laughs> attention to. He released a review of Old Boy 2013, just talking about how great it is. And at the beginning of the review, he talks about the 2003 old boy, like, the only reason anybody would like this movie is just because they're a pretentious person trying to prove to people that they enjoy foreign films. Like, oh, yeah, look how special am I, <laughs> I, am I am for recommending this film that you've never heard of. And it, like someone's only reasons for enjoying it could ever possibly be just some sort of fake elitism <laughs> And that it's not real enjoyment and that they're pretending to just so they, they seem cool in film circles or can impress people that have never seen a Korean mm. movie. That was his takeaway. And so I'm, I'm always curious, like, what that person would think watching my review. They hate my content. <laughs> they, mm. they, they get irrationally <laughs> offended at my content. But I, I'm curious if they would ever, like, try to engage <laughs> with what I'm saying <laughs> and if they've changed their mind or if they still feel that way. Because, like, I don't... You know, it's a pretty thorough, in-depth, you know, I'm not trying to toot my own horn too much, like, but you got to be proud of what you work on if you care about what you work on. And I, that's something, that video is something that I put a lot of care and time and thought and effort into. And I think it shows. I'm just curious if someone could watch that and still come away with that perspective or if they would watch that and be like, oh, I, I missed a lot about what people love about this movie. I'm curious. Yeah, I, th I think pe people just have their conclusions and then worry about how they got there later, you know? I guess they've already decided the new one's better. And <laughs> For whatever reason. But like, yeah. But like, I, I, I don't even know what that New York Times thing was even really saying, we're trying to say. Like, it's one in one ear, out the other for me. Like, I don't know. I don't really know why you think that and <laughs> yeah, how you got to that conclusion. Uh, maybe... Maybe if I read the full review. There's so much bad review content that has like a higher standard because it's attached to something like the New York Times. There's this this implication of old media, legacy media versus new media. The fact that, you know, on YouTube, anybody can say anything or anybody can get popular because like kids can watch them and it's not mm -hmm. legitimate or whatever. But there's a lot of really bad, vapid, surface level, not properly thought out, but content like this in legacy media where you read through an entire article and it's in the New York Times or Washington Post or whatever giant publication and you don't really understand why they liked the movie by the end of it or why they disliked the movie by the end of it and it seems like they kind of just bullshitted doing like a like they were <laughs> handing in a fucking English assignment uh, trying, <laughs> yeah. trying to talk about yeah. a subject that they're not really interested in and you know, it, it's it's interesting how that exists and that there still is this stigma. Yeah, it can yeah. feel quite cliquey. Yeah, like they're trying to, I just picture like, you know, all the critics going to the press screening and then them all trying to think of like the funniest. The quip. Headline. The quip, yeah. Like it, yeah, and that can really emanate beyond where it's like, and people, they're just looking for the way they feel to be expressed in words, you know? doesn't need to get so ridiculous. I've hung out with some people that, are, and this is not to say that all uh, people in legacy print media are like this, but no, I've hung out not. with some of them that 
my conversations with them like at like a party at TIFF or whatever, everything that they had to say about their experience there was like which celebrity that they got to talk to. Mm-hmm. And I was like, is that is this is just all about clout for you? And and one of them was like, you know, he he was asking me about like my following. He's like, oh, how do I get a big following like that? I'm like, well, you know, if you have something that you feel you have to say about a movie, it's just about, you know, expressing it in that way that is relatable and, you know, like trimming down the fat and making it consumable and make it, you know, focus on the things where you actually have a lot to say about it. Those can be your bigger projects. And then he stopped and he was like, no, 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 like your Twitter follow. How do I get more engagement on my tweets? And I was like, oh, well, I mean, you know, they kind of go hand in hand. Like people care about what I have to say on yeah. Twitter because of my the content that I make. And it, it, it seemed like this weird disconnect where he didn't really understand. And this is a guy that's like, I'm not going to say which publication, but it, like it's a major like news. Mm-hmm. Like, and it's like, it's like what, how do you get that job? Like, what do you do? Like, I, I, <laughs> I guess the, some of these people went to college and got like journalism degrees. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you have to do. And maybe th- that's what they look at when you apply for the job. And, you know, can you can you write a certain amount of characters? Can you write a certain amount of sentences and give a number at the end? Like, I... There's a reason why you don't see a lot of legacy media critics that have made a name for themselves. When you see a review by IGN, you don't think of the guy or girl who mm-hmm. wrote the review. You see the words IGN. The only reason anybody's looking at what they've written or is paying attention to what they've written is because of the entity that they're attached to and not necessarily because of their own words. The few critics and writers who have broken past that are ones that have something interesting to say, regardless of what platform or entity that they're attached to. Mark Kermode is doing his own thing. Like, we're not watching Mark Kermode because it's BBC. We know his name, right? He's at least interesting. Yeah. Fucking Armand White is interesting, right? <laughs> like, he's he he has a voice that, you know, we disagree with almost entirely consistently <laughs> on... But yeah. you know he's he's an interesting character, and you can you can tell, you know you you could post one of his articles and be able to guess who wrote it. Yeah, right. No, so. I'm, I'm noticing it more and more of like the the old media like playing catch up with like what the internet has done uh, with dismantling it. Um, the, certain sectors are starting to catch up, starting to figure it out, finally be like, oh, like this. I've been doing politics for this branch for how, however many years i could go solo and do this myself be in control of it and find more success potentially and mm-hmm. you know, the smart ones have been doing that and that's what like the smart people who yeah. were at ign like the early 2000s branching off like around 2012 2013 that's what the smart ones did use it as a platform and built their own thing um and now they're way more <laughs> influential than you know, the, an IGN review. And if you're successful at what you're doing independently, there's no reason for you to want to attach yourself to the New York Times or CBC yeah. or there's no incentive for you to do that when you're already doing things on your own that people connect with. So then it, it creates even it, it exacerbates the problem where after a certain point, the only people applying for those jobs are people that need to be attached to the entity for people to care about what they say yeah. or people for people to even hear what they have to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's, I, I prefer the way it's gone now because I think people do prefer having like a, a skill up type YouTube channel to go to for certain coverage or yeah, detaching it from these mega hyper brands and finding tastemakers or people that you know, you can just basically find whatever you're looking for. Um, there's there's going to be someone who represents the type of content you're after. And if not, you could do it, I guess. You know? Yeah. All right. I guess uh, we've been going for a while. I guess that's it for questions. Yeah. Um, unless there was like one more that you really wanted to fit in there. But we could do that if you wanted. But it's if there was something you were saving for the last one. I could do a little silly one. From, All right. Uh, M. La Turf fan base. When's the man, man, boy, boy, man, and an unkindness collab dropping? <laughs> yeah, what the hell, man? We could do it any day. I could. You, we could do it long distance. 
just uh yeah so we could we could uh make a track and you know if i'm not hitting the notes correctly then uh my boyfriend can fuck me while i'm recording it and uh it'll sound great <laughs> and all these uh <laughs> producers will, will be like whoa how do you do that it's a genius shit yeah that's true we, we know how to make a certified bop now we've seen the we've, yeah, yeah we have right. the blueprints <laughs> thank you the weekend for teaching us all how to be genuine real artists and fuck when i yeah. sing when I sing that song on the Man Man Boy Boy Man album, they'll be like, damn, your cancer mom is really shining through. <laughs> like, I can tell you were really affected emotionally when you sang this. Legit, though, yeah, I'll, let's, do, let's do something. That'd be fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Anytime. All right, it's your turn to recommend something. Mm. Have at it. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I have a double feature here for this recommendation. Uh, I've seen it in the subreddit a couple times, but I've had it on my list for a while now. I think it's time to go back to Danny Boyle, do 28 Days Later, Ooh. and the sequel, 28 Weeks Later. Not Danny Boyle, but same franchise, I guess, if you want to call it that. When's the last time you've seen him? A long time, probably over 10 years for both of them. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, so this will be nice to revisit. All right. Another, another DB joint. Perfect. Yeah, if uh, anybody listening at home, if you don't want to be spoiled for 28 Days Later and 28 Weeks Later, two films, one from 2002, one from 2007, watch them before the next episode comes out. These episodes come out every two weeks. Uh, you can listen to them early by going to sardonicast.com. Sign up for premium. It's only $2 a month. Patreon.com slash sardonicast will get you the same thing. You can support the show, feel good about yourself. And we haven't done this yet, but we're planning on doing like ad reads at some point. Mm -hmm. The premium versions and the Patreon versions will not have ads. Uh, so if you don't like ads, then get on it and we'll figure that stuff out at some point. We also have merch link in the description. We also have a Sardonicast highlights channel on YouTube. Go subscribe to that. Hit the bell. Hit the bell on the regular channel as well. Have a happy... Carte Blanche. <laughs> yeah, Carte Blanche, everybody. Have a have a good weekend. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. God damn it. The weekend. Have a good weekend. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.